And again, I say good morning, everyone. It's one of the hardest things of the job of testifying is turn on. It gives you a clue. You get a little red light. So we will be kind and gracious because we haven't mastered it either. Who's going to speak to us first? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Richard Head. I'm the Government Affairs Coordinator for the Judicial Branch. Um, I'm joined today by Judge Ashley, who is the Deputy Administrator of the Circuit Court, and Judge Garner, uh, who also sits in the Circuit Court. Um, just very briefly, I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves to you. I'll take 30 seconds because you really don't want to hear from me today. You're going to see me the most over the course of this session, but um, for today, I'm going to turn it over to the judges. Um, Judge Ashley will give a sort of overview of the circuit court, and Judge Garner will really focus on family division. But first, we're just going to have introdu introductions, and I'll address you for about 30 seconds. Good morning, folks. My name is Susan Ashley, and I'm the deputy administrative judge for the circuit court. Uh, judge King was not able to be here today. He's our administrative judge, so you likely are more uh, familiar with him. I have the opportunity as deputy administrative judge to do some of this administrative type work, but also I do still get to sit in court um, as a presiding judge down in um, usually Rochester. Sometimes I sub in elsewhere, but that's um, really where I, I hail from. And so it's good to see all of you today, and I'll talk with you very briefly after Richard does. Morning. My name is Michael Garner. I'm a circuit court judge, um, and I sit in Laconia virtually exclusively in the Fourth Circuit Court. Um, and I'll be talking mostly about family division, but as a circuit court judge, I hear all sorts of cases that come before us. And I'll be happy to answer whatever questions any of you may have as I go along. Thanks. And um, on that point, we do encourage anyone who has any questions. Um, you have two judges who are here to answer any and all questions that you may have. Um, just very briefly. Excuse me, just a, just a reminder to the folks here, because we have a lot of brand new reps. Uh, you may ask questions, but I'm the gatekeeper, so put your hand up. And because people sometimes down the far corners are just a bit out of my sight line, it is appropriate for people to to do that so I can see a hand that is up. Yes. Uh, fair point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I apologize. I won't be able to see to the right that well. Um, so very briefly, you know, there are two trial courts in, in the state of New Hampshire. We have the Superior Court. We're not going to focus on Superior Court today, um, but we also have the Circuit Court. Circuit Court um, in, I think it was 2012, uh, consolidated what used to be family court, probate court, and district court, and made them divisions of the circuit court. So we now have the circuit court, so we no longer have a family court, we have family division of the circuit court. And the judges in circuit court can sit in any of the divisions, and in any particular day may be sitting in all of the divisions. The, the cases are all um, coming before them, there tends to be a, uh, a schedule within the course of a week as to the type of cases. So there may be a day where you're gonna hear criminal cases. There may be a day where you're more likely to have the family docket in front of you. Um, but the circuit court judges can be sitting in any of the divisions. Um, and with that, I'm just gonna talk, uh, turn it over to Judge Ashley, have her talk about circuit court, those divisions, and really what it, what it, uh, what it contains. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So um, as Richard indicated, under circuit court, there are the three divisions. And so you'll still see and hear a lot of folks say, I got to go down to district court, right? So district court, of course, pre circuit court, there were standalone buildings that was the local district court building. When family division was developed, family division, by and large, there are exceptions, shared space in the district court building. So there was the district division and the family division together. 
Then when circuit court came along and pulled in uh, probate as well, then we have the three divisions and those courts are scattered throughout the state. Um, as Richard said, our judges do um, sit on all of these case types or can be assigned to sit on all of these case types and often are doing that within the course of one day. Um, probate, of course, um, is our smallest case numbers, but have some significant cases, particularly our trust cases, but they have the trusts and estates, guardianship over incapacitated individuals, um, equity matters, those types of cases. Then we have our district division, which is probably most familiar to a lot of folks because it has our small um, level criminal cases, also our small claims cases and, and civil cases of a certain a lower um, financial value. We do landlord tenant cases in our district uh, division as well. So those are the primary matters that we're handling in the district division. It's very busy um, and it's a lot of folks coming in and out of the courthouse um, for those matters. Then we have family division, and obviously this committee is going to be focused by and large on family cases. Some folks automatically go to divorce parenting, which is what Judge Garner is going to likely spend a lot of time talking with you about today. But family division is not just divorces and child support and parenting cases. There is um, the large spectrum of all things family that are in family division. So that includes our juvenile cases, abuse, which includes abuse and neglect cases, delinquency matters, CHINS cases, children in need of services. Those are all what we often refer to as our juvenile cases. There are cases that come off of those sometimes, like termination of parental rights. We have our adoption cases also in family division. Um, so those are all family division case types. We also handle guardianship over minors. Um, so we have many guardianship over minor cases. And then we have our domestic violence petitions. Again, those are the civil petitions, not criminal charges that relate to domestic violence. Those would be in district division. But our standard domestic violence petition, one person asking for a protective order against another person, those are also handled in family division. So all of those things um, come to us on a daily basis. There are emergencies involved in almost every one of those family division case types. Um, and so we need to be prepared to respond to those on a daily basis um, in high, high volume. Um, but of course, we also handle divorce, parenting, child support. And so we're going to turn, I'm going to turn it over to Judge Garner today to address you on those matters, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have on any of those divisions or anything in particular in family division itself. Thank you. Any questions, any questions so far? And just to put the, 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 a little context or scope in terms of the numbers. When we're talking um, circuit court, you have about 125 new, 125,000 new cases every year. Um, of those, about 64, 65,000 are criminal. Um, in the just domestic, uh, you have about 10,000, um, and domestic violence around 4,500. So just to put a little scope and context in terms of of what is sort of flowing through that court system. Thank you. <clears throat> Morning again, thank you. Thank you for having me. I ordinarily sit in the Laconia Circuit Court, that's the fourth circuit court, and I'm there as a full-time judge, I'm the presiding judge there. Um, I would like to invite questions as we go along. I, the time available this morning really won't give me an adequate opportunity to touch on every facet of the circuit court, ev even every facet of the family division. But I think it's more important for me to be a resource to answer questions that you may have so that, so that uh, you can have more of an informed sense of what we do in the court. So feel free to ask. If you forget to ask a question and it occurs to you later on, um, have someone let Richard know and send him an email and I'll be happy to try to respond. The only limitations on answering questions are that um, please don't ask me about a case that's pending somewhere, whether you use the name or not. And um, I'll be grateful if you don't ask me to weigh in on particular proposed bills that are going to be in front of your committee. Our judicial branch has a way of addressing those, uh, but that wouldn't be up, that decision wouldn't be up to somebody like me. And so I'm just going to defer to them for that. 
I'm as a circuit court judge, I'm cross trained in all three of the divisions, family, district and probate. Um, we have four courtrooms in Laconia and there are three other judges who sit there part time. Each of them, with one exception, the one who does just probate, each of them does all of the things that any of us do. I also have a judicial referee that we work with. That's a retired judge who's over 70 who um, sits part-time in Laconia doing primarily juvenile cases, but can do some other cases as well. And I have a child support referee, one of only two or three in the state who does exclusively child support and um, also sits there part-time. We share him with Manchester a couple of days a week. Let me just supplement Richard's description of the numbers involved by letting you know the new case filings that we had in the Laconia Family Division last year, based on my, um, my inexpert review of the docket numbers. We had uh, domestic relations cases, about 385 new filings last year. And by domestic relations, I mean divorce, parenting, and those cases that are exclusively child support, typically brought by the division. We had roughly half that number of cases that are brought forward. And these are cases where there had been in the past a final order, and the parties, for whatever reason, are bringing the case forward to modify that final order in some way. So we had typically about half of the new filings, um, in addition to those, are brought forward cases. In domestic violence cases, we had about 254 domestic violence petitions filed last year. In juvenile cases, as Judge Ashley mentioned, these are abuse and neglect cases, uh, chins, delinquency, uh, TPR, adoption cases. Um, we had 180 of those. In minor guardianship cases, we had 85. And so uh, totaling that up, we're looking at a rough number of about 1,000 cases in Laconia Family Division filed last year. And I think that's basically an accurate number in terms of the number of active cases we have at any point in time, probably 1,000. It goes up or down, obviously, uh, but that's the rough number. In Family Division, because I'm the presiding judge and I'm there full time, I'm responsible for something like 55 or 60 percent of those cases, and that's just how it falls out. Uh, the part-time judges come in and they get assigned cases um, and manage their dockets, which are similar to my dockets. I have three basic duties in what I do. My first duty as a judge is to conduct hearings, to hear uh, cases, and to generate orders from those hearings. I think you may have a copy of um, recent dockets. Do they have those? They don't have those. Thank you. All right. Uh, you're going to get a copy of uh, three days of recent dockets. I think it's Monday through Wednesday of last week. Um, that'll give you a sense of what we do on a daily basis. Two, one of those days is a full day final hearing. Two of them were typical list days with a variety of different cases, all within family division. The second thing that I do as a presiding judge is to field emergency motions that get filed every day, and these uh, would typically be in domestic violence cases. Um, for example, if a, if a litigant gets a, an emergency protective order from the police the night before, then that litigant can come to court the next day. The emergency order stays in place until 4 p.m., and they can come to court and file a domestic violence petition. There are also emergency motions that are filed in uh, parenting or divorce cases, really in any of the cases possibly, but those are the cases that come up most often. And the presiding judge's job is to review those filings when they're made, to determine whether there needs to be a hearing immediately that day on, on that uh, motion, to confirm that when it's required, there's been notice to the other side and they have some opportunity to come in and file an objection or a response and to issue an order by the end of the workday about those motions. We never know from day to day uh, how many of those motions there are going to be. Typically Mondays are busy and typically Friday afternoons are busy. Beyond that, there's always a certain number. Um, and so part of my job is to field those motions and take the appropriate steps to issue orders if necessary. The last part of my job that's sort of a core function is to sign documents that the clerk's office has put together that are typically motions that are filed by one side and then objections or responses filed by the other side 
um, there's the rule is 10 days to file an objection or a response so the clerk will get a motion they'll wait the 10 days and if an objection or response comes in then those are put into the file and the file is left for me, for me to uh, review and sign those and uh, typically that's a significant part of my work week um, I am lucky enough to have two referees at the court where I work a judicial referee and a child support referee and uh, each of their orders must be countersigned by a judge who reviews the order to determine whether they've applied the correct legal standard. So that sort of adds to my uh, pile of motions at any given moment that I have to look at and sign. And um, aside from motions that are called expedited motions, I get to those motions as I can. So those are my three core functions as a judge, as a circuit court judge. I also, like all of my colleagues, am available to take emergency uh, emergencies that come up and that are that need a judicial order that happen after hours. So typically, those are domestic violence emergency orders where the police call up and say, "We'd like to get an emergency protective order for this person. It's good till the next day if it's granted." And uh, sometimes those are motions that are brought uh, before me with uh, by DCYF who needs an emergency placement for a child who may be removed from the parents care for that for that moment um, we're all all of us are typically always on call for those sorts of things let me give you a sense of what um, my typical day is like if that's helpful for you the court is open at eight o'clock in the morning and we stay open until four typically my hearings start at 8 30 and so the time that I have to spend between when I get to court and that first 830 hearing is typically spent looking at the signing cart for motions that may be necessary for the clerk to have and get to work on uh, earlier in the day looking at my files I'll pick up a stack of files from the clerk's office and take them upstairs to chambers and I begin to look at them um, in the order in which they're going to be heard so that I can reacquaint myself with files that I have a certain level of knowledge about and so I can learn about files that I've never seen before and I'll typically look at whatever the current pleading is if it's a motions hearing I'll look at the motion the objection I'll try to get some sense of the background and because I typically do most of my own orders I'll create a caption on my laptop that will allow me later on to create an order once I've done that hearing I'll also check uh, because the Belknap County House of Corrections will is available to us for video arraignments at 10 o'clock every morning. I'll check to see if anyone's in custody and needs to be arraigned. Typically, the judge who's doing criminal docket will do that arraignment at 10 o'clock in the morning, but uh, sometimes we, I don't have another judge there, and so it'll be up to me to find a space within my family division docket to go downstairs and do that arraignment. Our hearings are uh, typically scheduled for 30 minutes and uh, almost every sort of hearing is typically scheduled for 30 minutes and my aim in that time is to get the hearing done and if the hearing doesn't take the whole 30 minutes my aim is to get started on writing the order some hearings will take more than 30 minutes that's inevitable although the parties are told when they get the notice that the hearing is being scheduled for 30 minutes or if it's for longer for an hour or two hours or whatever they know that in advance but if you have a complicated case with several different different issues and sometimes if you have attorneys uh, the cases are going to run over the 30 minutes and it's my job to manage that docket so that at the end of the day I'll be able to have conducted all of the hearings within the time allotted so sometimes that leaves me time to write the orders and sometimes it doesn't and it's the unusual day when I get all of my orders done by the time the last hearing is done. Uh, more typically I'm working on orders after hours to get as many of the orders done as I can. And obviously triaging orders that can be done quickly, orders that are expedited, that have an urgent need, and taking a little more time and setting aside orders that may be final orders after contested final hearings so that I have a chance to digest what I've heard, to look at exhibits, if there are exhibits, and to um, sort of recreate the testimony in my head so that I can make those decisions about uh, final orders. And the emergencies and the other things just sort of fill in the gaps. So if I 
have a break for some reason in the middle of the day that's unexpected, I'll check with the clerk to see what I can do. And um, if nothing else, there's always there are always files downstairs for me to look at and sign. Uh, difficult cases or final hearings that may be a full day, sometimes um, multi-day final hearings, typically involve exhibits. They'll typically involve testimony of multiple witnesses. I take notes on my laptop in the courtroom. That's just a personal idiosyncrasy of mine, and folks get used to the noise after a while. But it really helps me um, recreate what I've heard and work with what I've heard. So that if I do a, a contested final hearing, when I get to writing the case, I'll reprint my notes and read them and I'll look at the exhibits and that way I have a fresher flavor. If it's been a couple of weeks before I get started working on the case, I'll be able to recreate it um, to work on it that way. Writing time is precious for any circuit court judge who works in the family division. There is not really enough writing time. Um, I'm typically behind, and I say that knowing that Judge Ashley, who's in charge of keeping track of that sort of thing, is sitting here. Um, but um, I've always felt as though doing an order that's the best order you can do makes it worth the time, and so I don't sacrifice quality for time when I write my orders. Um, and we just try to keep up. Any questions so far? The contested final hearings, particularly in cases, that in cases that involve children, are difficult, even if there are attorneys involved. They're difficult for the litigants. There is a, there's an intrusiveness that's inherent in the court system. People don't like someone else making decisions about their children's lives, and that's course. Why would you? Why would anyone? The system, though, is designed ultimately to allow that to happen and require it to happen when a decision has to be made and the parties haven't been able to reach decisions on their own. But I want to emphasize that in family division, we provide multiple opportunities for parties to work together and to try to create agreements on their own, particularly agreements that relate to their children. So we have a first appearance process which is basically a lecture given by, it used to be a live judge before COVID and now it's on video, that uh, is given to folks who are in a divorce with children or parenting cases. And they come to court or nowadays they go online from home and they watch the video. And the video is basically a description of the process, a description of the mediation part of the process and an encouragement for the parties to try to work out as many agreements together as they can to take advantage of mediation if they can do it. Mediation is mandatory in, in these sorts of cases. There are some exceptions. If there's a domestic violence order, for example, both parties have to agree to mediation and those mediations only take place at the courthouse. But by and large, folks uh, will go to mediation before they go to their first contested hearing in a parenting, in a case that involves children. Our mediators are certified by the marital, uh, the family uh, mediator board. They are vastly experienced. The group of mediators that we use in Laconia have been doing it for more than a decade at least. They have hundreds of cases that they've done. They're really effective. And so we provide that off ramp immediately in the process and give the parties as much opportunity and as much encouragement as we can to try to reach as many agreements as they can together. We also have the Child Impact Program, which is another mandatory program. It's given by different um, resource providers in different communities. But it's basically a, a short program to help folks understand the impact of divorce or separation on their children and to help folks develop skills for managing the difficulties that their children are going to experience as part of that process. It is mandatory. We don't get a lot of feedback about it, but the feedback that I've gotten about it is that it can be life-changing for folks who just don't know how to talk to each other about parenting issues and who really need some guidance about how to make that work. So we ask that folks do that, complete that program within 45 days of the filing. That happens sometimes, but not always. 
but we remind them of it at every opportunity. And we expect that by the time they're getting to a contested hearing, they're going to have done the child impact program and they'll have, a, have an understanding of what that expectation is. The parenting plan form itself, uh, which I hope you have a chance to look at. At some point, you should look at that form. It's an eight or nine page form and it was designed by, <coughs> designed by a committee um, that took a lot of uh, different points of view into account. The language in the form is, is generally the committee's language, but parents are always encouraged to modify the form or change it or not use it or pick language that works for them and for their children. But it is a sort of a shorthand way of describing a child's life. There's almost everything you can think about that would impact a child's life that has a place in that form. We expect, if we don't expect uh, parents to really have a good sense of any of the other forms within the family division, we do expect that they become familiar with the parenting plan, at least to be able to go through it with each other. And if they're not able to reach agreements to be able to present their version of it to the court at a contested final hearing. It's a critical document. It's intended to be user friendly for folks who may not have much experience with the court system. And it can be very valuable for the court in analyzing what's going to be in the children's best interest based in part upon what each parent is proposing happen with them. So I would encourage you to have a look at that, at that form. That's, that's our sort of go-to form in terms of parenting. We also uh, Judge Garner, may I interrupt you at this point with Certainly. a couple of requests? Number one, could you get that form to us, either one copy to my committee assistant or uh, 16 copies for each member of the committee. And then secondly, a question, um, if one or both of the parents refuse to go through one of the programs or work on the document, what strictures do you have for them? Certainly, the, the mediation part of it, um, if if there's a domestic violence order in place, both parties have to agree to go to mediation. If either of them doesn't want to go to mediation, we won't do it. So that's an automatic opt out. We don't inquire about the reasons. There are some factors that might be present in some cases which would exempt folks from mediation. And um, I'm gonna go back now about four or five years before pandemic when I was doing the first appearance I would describe those factors to the folks who were in the courtroom if they felt that one of the factors might apply to them, then we'd have a brief hearing immediately after the first appearance session. They could tell me why they don't want to go to mediation. I would consider that and in some cases they would be exempt from going to mediation. But the presumption is that they will go. If they don't go to mediation, then there are some factors there are some consequences that could take place technically. It's a court order that you go to mediation. They could be found in contempt. I've, I've never seen that happen because I'm not quite sure what the sanctions would be. More likely the mediator would report that they didn't settle the case or one party didn't show up and they'd be put back onto the litigation track, which is just what's your next contested hearing and that would be what we did. One might assume that the party that refuses, if it be one of the two, it might be taken into account in any judgments? Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. I wouldn't. Okay. I, partly because what happens in mediation is completely confidential. Okay. We don't learn at all, and we're very careful about not learning what people say to each other in mediation or what the mediator might have said to them. And consistent with that, I would never inquire about someone why they didn't go to mediation unless they had expressed, say there was a hearing in front of me and they said, of course, we want to go to mediation, we're going to do this. Then if the mediator filed a report saying that this person just didn't participate, didn't show up, didn't explain why, none of that, I might have some question for them. But Judgments about what will be in the best interests of children are not affected by a party's unilateral choice not to participate in mediation. It's a separate process. It's a very successful process, uh, but it's not a process that 
that uh, is going to result in an adverse consequence in terms of your parenting rights if you don't participate. Thank you. Representative Bickford with a question. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, you've listed a number of tools that you've used, and I was here when we created them. The, uh, as you mentioned, the Family Law Committee um, we created, and the uh, parenting plans was something I brought forward with uh, John Cameron. Um, how are they working out? Um, would you rather go back uh, to something else? Do you, and do you need new tools to work with? I would say the parenting plan has been a great success. Oh. It's, a, it's a straightforward form. Folks can read it. They can go through it. Um, it provides options for them. It provides ample space for them to write their own orders. And it's a document that parents can sit down across a table and work through in a cooperative way. Even if it's not a cooperative way, the mediators are so familiar with the parenting plan that they can help the parents understand the nuances. They can even suggest language that might work. And ultimately, it's, it works because it empowers parents to achieve these agreements for themselves. So I would say that's been a great success. There are, there are bits and pieces of language in there that with the benefit of a decade of experience or so, we could tweak. But I wouldn't make any wholesale changes to the parenting plan. That's been great. And, and I would say the same thing of mediation. We have a high success rate in mediation. We encourage people to do it. In fact, um, part of the package for mediation is that um, you get five hours. And some folks are they're almost always scheduled for a two-hour session to begin with. And then if they're not successful, they come back onto the sort of contested hearing track. But if you've scheduled a final hearing, and if sadly we're, like most courts, I think, we're months out scheduling a final hearing, at least several months out, you have that time and the folks can use the rest of their five hours in mediation. So you really get at least two shots at it uh, to try to make the mediation part of it work. And I think it's been very successful. Uh, we do have two more questions that I will accept, and then we're going on to the next speaker. And thank you so much. We'll have to have you guys back again. Chair recognizes the clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Th th thank you, Your Honor, for taking Certainly. my question. Um, what recourse does an individual have if uh, the other party is in violation of the, uh, the parental plan, the parenting plan? Typically, there are two sorts of claims that are made there. One is a claim for contempt. The parenting plan, once the court has approved it, is a court order. And uh, the sanctions for contempt can be sort of wide ranging, which could include, um, could include a fine. It could include, I mean, in an extreme case, it could include incarceration, although I've never had the op never had, the, had to make that decision. That's not usually on the table. It, could um, include a limitation on a person's ability to uh, actively engage in certain issues in the case. And um, ultimately, it could be a part of an order that might take into account the question whether there's been um, an unwarranted interference with the other party's parenting rights. So that's one of the standards under 461A11 by which you can modify an existing final order. So if a parent is interfering with the other parent's parenting rights, it could be by contempt, it could be by not following the parenting plan. That might uh, be a basis for a modification of those uh, orders. Again, that would require a separate request to modify. Just in terms of the sanctions, it's, it's basically uh, a fine, uh, potentially incarceration, limitation on uh, ability to to uh, participate in the case. There could, there could be others. The uh, court has some discretion in terms of the imposition of certain kinds of sanctions. Um, and so it might be appropriate in some cases to issue a sanction that's more directly related to a parenting issue, but you have to be discreet about it. It has to be a one-time thing. Thank you. And final question for this group of people, Representative Vice Chairman Long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Judge. Very good information. Um, if uh, I, I believe it was four or five terms ago, all conflict divorces were handed to a particular judge who did all that. Um, I, it, 
appears that that is not the case anymore. High high conflict yes. cases were handed to one particular judge yes. who did all those. You mean the complex case docket? Uh, correct. Certainly. Um, my memory is that that was Judge Foley at the time. That's correct. Yeah. And it was a statewide program, and Judge Foley took cases. They were vetted to make sure they were high conflict cases, but he had a docket of them, and he was able to focus exclusively on that docket. And he was very experienced, so he was able to manage those cases in a way that none of the rest of us would have the time and, in some cases, the experience to do. Um, and I'm aware that in Hillsboro, Hillsboro. So, um, if I if I could just jump in, we still have a complex docket oh, um, okay. now. Judge Lemire spoke last year. Some of you were on this committee last year, but Judge Lemire um, handles our complex docket now. And again, it's similar to what Judge Garner described. It's for the those cases that might need seven, eight, nine days of trial and incredibly complex in issues or uh, particularly um, difficult circumstances in a particular case. We still okay. have the ability to do that, but but not nearly um, enough. So we do have judges in all of our courts handling handling matters that are in conflict, unfortunately. Great. Thank you. Certainly. And thank you so much. Uh, before you go, I, I know there are other questions, and I have one too, and mine will not be asked either because we have another speaker. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier whom we get in touch with, not you. Who is the one that should we have an appropriate question, not about a particular case? Who do we talk to? Um, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you can always ask, email me, uh, call me, or I'll be in this uh, in your meetings frequently. Um, all questions can come through me. After uh, we're done here today, I'm going to be emailing out the parenting plan form uh, to the group and uh, the dockets that the judge mentioned. That will have my email address, my cell phone address, um, so you'll all have that uh, available to you. I encourage you, anybody who has questions, um, should feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Can I have 10 seconds, Mr. Chairman? 10. First, don't hesitate with the questions. If I'm not allowed to answer something, I won't. But second, uh, if you have a chance, come to court. Come to court and watch what happens. Most of these domestic relations cases are public cases. The public can come in mm -hmm. and watch and listen. I think it's the, it's the best way to get a handle on what happens in the courtroom and to get real uh, on-the-spot experience about what these folks are going through and, and how dramatic these cases can be and how uh, challenging they can be, not for us, but for the folks who are involved in the cases. So please come to court. Come to Laconia. I'll show you around. Thank you so much. I have a private tutorial every Thursday evening with Sam Watterson. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And 20 years of reruns over the summer. I binge watched. Unfortunately, he doesn't do family law. And now the Office of the Child Advocate, come on up and introduce yourselves to us, please. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Cassandra Sanchez. I am the Child Advocate for the state of New Hampshire. And I have with me Jennifer Jones, and she is an Assistant Child Advocate with our office. We currently have a vacant position of the Associate Child Advocate, which is an attorney position for our office. They often spend quite a lot of time here in legislature throughout the session. So with that position vacant, if I am unable or there are multiple hearings at one time, Jennifer would be in filling in for myself. So I wanted to bring her here today and introduce her to all of you. Thank you. So here we're passing around some materials from the office. I have in with those materials, it is um, a brief copy of our strategic plan, which includes the mission and the vision of the office, as well as some, as some of our goals. I attached with it my business card and the office business card. My business card will have my direct cell phone contact if you have any questions specific to bills or to um, topics which may be come before you that my office may have some data or some information on, please do not hesitate to reach out anytime. You can reach me on my cell phone there at any hour. 
And so I came to today prepared to provide you a brief overview on the office um, and leaving plenty of time for questions and, and comments if needed. So to share my office's independent oversight over child serving entities within the executive branch agency. So that includes the Department of Ch the Division of Children, Youth and Families, as well as other child serving agencies. So that it would include the de um, Department of Education. We have oversight as well over the Bureau of Children's Behavioral Health, which provides a lot of the community based services at this point, those community based services that were previously served under the Division of Youth and, and Children Family Services are, is now located under the Bureau of Children's Behavioral Health. And we also have oversight over the organizations, private or nonprofit organizations that contract with state agencies. So this allows our oversight over all of the residential facilities as well as additional community-based services that are contracted with either DCYF or the Bureau of Children's Behavioral Health. In our daily work, um, we have a multi-tiered focus. We do work at the case level, so we will get complaints that come into our office in regards to children involved in the juvenile justice system, receiving those community-based services, or involved with DCYF. And on those cases, we will do, um, we don't necessarily call them investigations, but we do do um, some reviews of the system to ensure that they are operating in the ways in which they should, that they're following their own policies, procedures, and the laws that exist. And if they are not, we will then meet on those independent cases and make recommendations to ensure that they do follow the policies and laws. And so that is a good chunk of the work that the assistant child advocate here, Jennifer Jones does, as well as another assistant child advocate in the office. So they do that independent case work and managing the complaints that come into the office. We also track those complaints in our own com computer system so that we can follow trends over time and we can collect data. And we use that data and trends to report back. Um, I do monthly reporting to the Oversight Commission on Children's Services. So we share there a lot of the data and trends that we're seeing. And we also share them through hearings. If there's a hearing on a particular topic that we've collected data and we have found trends, we will ensure that we provide that information here before you or other uh, committees. Uh, typically, it would be Child and Family Law or Health and Human Services primarily, but there are times that the office also ends up in house education. So that's that, that higher level. And then we also work with the agency on improving their own policies and practices. So taking a look at best practice around the country, we do a lot of research focused on child development, on brain development, and a focus on ACEs. And we'll use that research and we will advise on changes that they can make to the system to improve the well being of children in the state of New Hampshire. With the division, we also work with the Bureau of Children's Behavioral Health doing much of the same. At this point, there's a lot of research backing the evidence-based treatments, a lot of which have already rolled out in our state. And so we always do help advocate for additional positions to fill that because we see the need in the community is extremely high. There's a lot of acuity with our children across the state right now. So we're all, always advocating for additional positions in the evidence-based practices that are available right now, as well as seeking out others that are utilized in other areas in the country that we could potentially bring to the state of New Hampshire. So as I had mentioned, we see high needs of children at this time. And, and what I mean by that is the mental health needs of the children across New Hampshire has exacerbated over time. We do believe a lot of that is due to the impact of COVID. And so we are watching that very closely and really working to see the ways in which providers are serving families that are effective and helping spread that across the state. Um, but with that, we have seen a need of children continuing to wait in emergency rooms, awaiting that higher level inpatient care at Hampstead Hospital. And if unable to be serviced at Hampstead Hospital, unfortunately, we're finding that many of those families are left without any follow-up or any ability to connect with other systems for care. So we do receive some of those through complaints. And when we do, we ensure to refer them to the appropriate service and ensure follow through for that family that they were able to work with that service to get the help that they need in their family home. But that is a small impact. So we try to do that on a larger level through education and outreach. And so we will do education and outreach with community provider agencies so that if they are seeing 
families struggling with more complex needs than they can meet, that they can refer those families to our office and they know how to do so. And we will also do it with parent groups and with children as well. We often spend a lot of time going out to the residential facilities and meeting with children, ensuring that, they, that our number is visible because children do have the right to call our office at any time. And so we ensure that the facilities are posting our number so children can see that and that they know how to access our office, as well as offering them times when we are out there to sit down and meet with us individually one-on-one -on -one for confidential conversations so they can report any concerns that they may have. So I'll take pause for questions. Who designed your business card? It's incredible. It's got your name, and then it says, The Child Advocate. Why, do you have a cape, too? I mean, this is cool. I don't, I think but that would be great. really cool. <laughs> Sorry, Representative Grossman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here. I'm curious, do, does that happen often where kids do reach out um, calling the office or during these confidential conversations that you have when you visit a facility? Are they using that? Yes, they are. Uh, we've really put a concerted effort into ensuring that the office is known as a resource. And this has taken some time with COVID. There's been a lot of barriers to that. So this past year, we've really put an effort into being face to face in meeting with these children so that when they put a face to the name of the office, they knew they know who they're calling. They knew who they're going to see on the other end of the phone. And we have received a lot more calls that way. We have children that we've connected with in person at a facility and something may occur a month or two later and they're picking up the phone and they're calling our office and they are connecting with us. So we are tracking to see if, our, we just finished our last annual report, so to see if our numbers from last year increase from this coming year and just by the numbers that we were getting for calls so far in, in this annual year, so our annual year starts um, October 1st. So the numbers that we've received the number of calls we've received from October to present appears to already be an increase from last year. So those efforts seem to be working. Thank you. Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, with respect to the reports that you give to Children's Services Committee, um, are those copied to CFL chairman or are they, I don't, able, are they posted on your web? They are posted on our website. I do not believe that they are, are copied. Um, that is something that we can do. But currently, I do provide them in person during the meetings, and then we will post them on the website. So they are publicly accessible. Okay. And a uh, follow-up, if I may? Oh, how often? Did, did you say how often those are? Those, mo those meetings are monthly, um, just skipping the summer months. So you report monthly? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. I should know the answer to this because I was the chairman of it for two years. Do you regularly or periodically or once in a great while report to DHHS Oversight Committee? Yes, that is that the Oversight Commission that takes place That's monthly. Yeah. yeah, that I chaired for two years. Yeah, yeah, I think you were there, weren't you? I was not at that time. Oh, good. It was my predecessor at that time, Moira O'Neill. I mean, not that I didn't, yes. you know what I mean, yeah. Well, I'm back on it. I don't know whether I'll share it or not, but we'll see you again. Oh, wonderful. One of the issues that comes up periodically with some of us as representatives is we get a constituent with a grievance and say, do something about it. Mm -hmm. And we can't always do something about it in a policy committee because our purpose is to examine and maybe change laws, not run grievances. It's a temptation. If somebody's all steamed up and we kind of think they may be right, that we want to do something here. Where that goes in these cases of children is to your office. Would that be correct? Yes, that is appropriate. The DHHS also has an ombudsman, which we refer to frequently, but families can be guided in our direction and we would help them with those steps in ensuring that they know how to access the DHHS ombudsman if they had not done so already. And once they do reach out to the ombudsman and if they feel their problem has not been resolved, we oftentimes will look in the case ensuring, as long as we have the jurisdiction over the issue that they're taking a look at, there are times that we will get calls about 
difficulties with their caseworker. And we will refer to the DHHS ombudsman and inform that that is not something that we would look to resolve. But if there is a specific issue with what is happening with their child on, on their case, we would be happy to look into it. So before referring out and just sending them off, we, we do a lot of education around working with the system, ensuring that they know the steps and the, the appropriate parties that they need to be in contact with on their case. So yes, we do accept referrals. We get them often from different reps or, or senators as well, where they'll be receiving calls from families that feel that they have exhausted the system and do not have anywhere else to go. And we always do our best to help them. Did I hear you possibly suggest that one calls the DHHS ombudsman first before they call your office? Did I hear that? So when we have a, a caller or complainant call into our office, we are required to ask if they have, if, if the itch, issue sits within the scope of the DHHS ombudsman, we do have to inquire whether they have interacted with the ombudsman. If they have not, we refer them there. We will hold their information until they contact them and get back to us and let us know whether the problem was resolved or not. But it is a requirement within our statute that we send them to the DHHS ombudsman. So it would save a, a dime if we called that person first. As, as long as it is within their jurisdiction, because our jurisdiction is okay. broader, oh, we, we can cover more. But yes, if it is a specific right. um, DCYF or Bureau of Children's Behavioral Health issue, then yes, the DHHS ombudsman would be the first touch point. And do you have that number handy? I can guess the first six, but it's the last four <laughs> that's hard. I don't have that off the top of my head, but I can send that along. Okay. I'm wondering if you might have that for us. I bet you will. I'm sure you will. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted Representative to, Raymond. Thank you. You got it. Um, I just wanted to say I still have that sheet that they passed out last week, so I have the number for the ombudsman here if you want me to read it aloud. Please. Okay. It's 603-271-3948, according to the sheet uh, that DHHS gave us last week. Does the com committee researcher agree? Maybe. You see, yet again, pieces of paper go faster than computers. <laughs> okay. And we'll find out. Okay. Any other questions? We've got a few minutes left. Thank you so much. We'll be seeing you again, I know. Thank you for having okay. me. Yes. Well, Take care. As we get ready for uh, opening our first hearing, uh, a couple of things for the members of the committee, please. Uh, members of the committee who are co-sponsors of bills, you can do one of two things. You can testify up there at the witness table if you wish. If you do, then when you come, you are no longer testifying, you cannot ask questions of anyone else. You can either stay up here and ask questions of anybody who comes to testify, or you can be one who testifies. Um, you do get a chance to speak later during exec time on bills, however. Uh, secondly, um, again, I've been asked to remind us, as other chairs are doing, that what we try to do here is ask questions and not testify. There'll be plenty of time for that. I know sometimes a question is a leading question, but uh, we have to be careful to make sure we're asking questions. Uh, third, a straightforward bill. Uh, easy peasy, uh, housekeeping. Uh, sometimes turn into three hour hearings, but more normally they are actually straightforward and they can be exact immediately afterwards if the chair and vice chair, or excuse me, the chair and the ranking member, who in this case is also the vice chair, if we agree to do so. 
if we want to go on and exec something to get things onto the calendar that look like it will be an easy bill if we agree. Otherwise, it has to be scheduled. We can no longer do it later in the day if there's a time gap. And fourthly, uh, Republicans, this is for you, uh, I get to recommend to the speaker various people to serve on various commissions and committees, and I've sent you emails, and some of you have gotten back to me. Actually, I've sent a few others, and I know, Representative Long, you're working the same kind of thing. Um, and so uh, some of you, thank you, you've gotten back to me. You said, wow, I'd love to serve on the commission of such and such. Um, and that, that'll go on to the speaker's office. Others of you, uh, here's your chance, get back to me. Does that belong anything along that lines for your, your folks? No, you covered it well, Mr. Chairman. Oh, thank yeah. you. No. Yeah. These are fun. For those of you who are new to the house, some of these can be fun. You learn all kinds of things. You get to meet a bunch of people that you wouldn't be meeting here otherwise, and so on. And now I'm going to open the hearing on House Bill 126 relative to choosing the accrual date for child support payments. And the chair recognizes Chairman Spillane to come forward and present your bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I'm hoping this is one of those straightforward bills that we just had heard about um, because I think that we all know that uh, people are paid at different schedules throughout the month th these days. Not everybody's paid weekly. And one of the things I ran into um, as I pay child support myself currently is that um, the lining up of when you have to pay and when your other bills are stacking doesn't always work. But what I, I and, and there was no option for me to change that accrual date or the, the due date to another date in the month like you can with your mortgage. You can often say, I don't like the first, I'd rather be on the 15th or I'd rather be on the 7th or something like that because it works better. And so what I'm trying to do is offer that flexibility of it. I'd love to see it be able to be so they could choose any week in the month, but I think that it, a simple step forward is to give them at least the choice of the the beginning of the month or the middle of the month and give them the choice of either the 1st or the 15th for their due date. Um, and that's all this bill does. It, uh, it basically changes that every single child support payer in the state be on the 1st to let's let the child support payer choose the 1st or the 15th as their due date. I'll take any questions if anyone has any. Representative Raymond. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Repre Representative Spillane. I'm curious about how um, this change would affect our Office of Child, our Department of Child um, Support Services um, at Health and Human um, Services, because right now they all pay process the payments at the same time. Will that change their um, staffing needs or their operational needs in any way? I don't expect that it would have any change in anything except for probably an update to the system software wise to allow uh, the flexibility to happen um, and for those people who have um, the pay taken out of their check it wouldn't make any difference anyway because it comes out every single pay period and and they just continue accruing constantly um, this would mainly affect people who have another agreement with their spouse and or pay in other ways and so I think the department could probably better answer that. But um, whereas there was no fiscal note attached to this, I don't think there's a huge impact. Um, and I cannot answer anything beyond potentially a software update to allow that flexibility. Representative Seidel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just curious on whether it's the 1st or the 15th, is that something that each person can choose every month or is it set once they choose one? Well, I would imagine they could go and ask for it to be changed in the future if their employment changed because we always have the ability if our employment changes or some, some major thing changes to talk to 
uh, Division of Child Support Services about changing how much child support or what have you, but that's usually done involving the court. And I would imagine that once they choose their date, that would be the date, unless something changed that they needed to petition to change it again. Representative Gregg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony today. Can you see of an impact on the payee with like bills being due at the first of the month or whatever, what kind of impact would this have to move it to the middle if they have like the childcare costs or anything they're get, getting that payment for? Well, again, that, that, is, that is a potential uh, thing that needs to be looked at. Usually this date is not done in isolation. It's done in agreement during the discussion on child support during the court period. Um, and if the payments are coming on time and never falling behind, then there wouldn't be a problem because the person would always have that check coming every month from Division of Child Support Services. Um, however, if somebody falls behind, then it becomes more of a problem with them getting their, their pay on time, or their, their child support on time. And falling behind is something I'm trying to avoid with this, where somebody repeatedly is falling behind every month because everything's due on the first and they'd be much better able to pay on a 15th than to try to manage their finances to try to fit it in with their mortgage or rent or whatever else they're also paying at the same time. Thank you. So that would then fall on the payee to, um, you know, talk to their bill people and say, hey, I'm not getting this till the 15th, so that they would need to switch that unless it's, you know, they are able to save up that half a month or whatever. Well, it I imagine that if, if there's any issues where it needs to be on the first and that's not going to work out for them, that would be brought up in the child support discussion in court before it even happened or with the mediator if an employment situation changes because both parties get to speak all the time right now anyway about um, what their situations are and, and they submit their financials and they talk about the whole landscape of everything before any decisions are made about how much it is and, and all this uh, and whether it's done automatically from pay that's all discussed. So I would hope and I would imagine that that discussion comes up when there's a court mediator to say, you know what, your, your payee is not going to be able to function on the 15th. So as much as it would work out for you, we can't do that. Would you assume that in uh, the conversations between a person and that person's ex and the court, uh, since we're moving from the first of the month to the 15th of the next month, there might be a gap half month payment. Otherwise, we've some people could have a problem. I guess it depends on when it would be implemented as a, as a change. Because okay. um, if it's starting out with a brand new case that has just been decided in court, there's been no payments yet. It's going straight on to child support on the 15th. If somebody's changing from the 1st to the 15th, uh, I know that, that uh, Division of Child Support Services often has to manage when it comes out of pay that doesn't happen on a, a weekly basis, um, how to catch up. And so I've seen it myself with um, where they say, now there's an additional X amount due every period for the next you know, three pay periods to try to catch up. So, Representative Grossman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative, for coming before us. So in your situation where you already are in an agreement with a set due date because you've gone through the process, how would this impact folks that already have a set date because they've already been through that process? So it doesn't describe in here any way that they could change it they would have to petition to the court to make a change to their child support. And both parties can submit this without an attorney. It doesn't cost anything. They just have to submit a written agreement between them that they want to change it. Or the one person can petition that they would like to change it and send copies to the other person. And then they get into the discussion with the mediator. Even if they both agree to it, it goes before the mediator to look at their financials again, discuss the situation, and decide whether they can change to it. If I was to, to, to do that for my case, um, which I'm not interested in, I'm perfectly fine with where it's at, but um, 
I would have to basically start that process by uh, discussing with my ex and deciding, do we want to do this jointly? Do we both agree on this? If so, let's just submit it. We'll ask them to go ahead and approve it. They'll look at it, discuss things with us and approve it. Or if we can't come to agreement on it, the mediator gets to look at both situations and decide, is that person constantly falling late? And is that a problem? Versus is this person needing that money on the first? Is that the problem? Where do we come to the middle? But at least gives them the flexibility to say, works better for both parties. Let's do it that way. Follow up. Thank you. Do you think that this may create a problem in the family courts, though, in terms of dealing with two parties that already may not? I mean, this is what the heart of the matter in divorce proceedings is, other than the children, obviously, but the conflict resolution in terms of the monetary. So if now the court people can go back and refile for a new motion, but they both have to agree to file for that motion. So, okay, let's not get too complicated on it because I need to break these down. There's a lot there. Um, child support is always the most con one of the most contentious things in the divorce, um, custody and child support. We know that. None of it's done outside of the, the court looking at the formulas and doing the mediation on things. And uh, essentially, anytime I want to petition, uh, I had a period uh, three years ago where I lost my job, laid off during COVID. I had to petition to the court to change the child support because I had no income. That was a petition to the court, explained why, new financials from both parties. We have to get on the phone. They look at the financials. They run the formula again. They decide when it's due. This would just add one more aspect into discussing the financials that says, would you like the due date on the 1st or the 15th? Does that work for both of you? If not, why? Um, it's not dragging open a new area. It's just part of the same discussion. Representative Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, this is about public assistance, the bill. And so it doesn't trigger until there's uh, someone applies for, say, welfare. And no. No? No. See, that's, it says on line three, any payment of public assistance made to or for the benefit of the dependent child creates a debt due to the department, not to the child, but to the department, because the child has... Well, this, is, gotten, this uh, is under the entire statute, though. I'm not sure why they put it there. Um, we can look at that and yeah. figure out why they put it there. But this this is under the entire section of about when the due date is to child support, to the Division of Child Support Services. Um, and so it's supposed to be outside of the public assistance area. There is a trigger within requesting for public assistance that requires that it be um garnished from wages yeah okay um but that basically makes the question of the first or the 15th moot if it's being garnished from the wages because it's being taken out at every pay period uh at that point so um it's a good question why it starts with that section on line three but it should not be addressing that it should be addressing only the due date for all of yeah I have 161C4 in front of me. Any payment of public assistance made to or for the benefit of a dependent child creates a debt due and owing to the department by any responsible parent, except as otherwise provided in 161C5, the amount of debt shall be equal to the calculation. And it goes on into a bunch of numbers. It's a modification of how that happens from only on the first to what you propose. So that's why it's worded as it is. It's getting us a running head start by quoting that whole little section. And my further assumption would be then that they consider the fact that you have a debt owed that's paid through the Department of Child and Family Services as being a route through the public assistance area because they handle the payment. The payment goes to Division of Child Support Services, which is then 
passed along to the parent. Okay. Yeah. That's the section. Yeah. Yep. May I just follow up? Yeah, follow up. Um, so based on your testimony, it sounds like you need to get back into another piece of the law to cover what you want to accomplish. And you, so I'm just, I guess I'm just I trusted the experts in this area to put it in the right place. And I'm hoping that this committee can also make sure it's in the right place, but it should be um, governing all of the due dates for child support, um, regardless of whether it's garnished or not, because it wouldn't make any difference, but to basically change that um, due date so that the person had the flexibility to decide. Okay, thank you. Any further questions for representatives for laying the bill's prime sponsor? Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you, members of the committee. And the chair recognizes Vivian Girard. She wishes to speak for three minutes, thank you. And you are rising in opposition to the bill, your pink card says. Thank you, Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Vivian Gerard, uh, formerly Silva, and a lot of you probably know me as a Silva v. Silva case. I disagree with this bill, and I don't think it makes any difference putting a date on the child support, so passing this bill is very in irrelevant. And I believe, as you had said, that it really goes back to the can Tandiff cases um, where this really is, it, it doesn't make sense. So um, from my experience, um, I've been, I, I've had 25 hearings and five appeals basically on child support. Um, I can tell you that, I mean, granted, I did have three bad judges, but I can see how this bill would work more with somebody that is a W-2 employee. If somebody is self-employed, this doesn't make sense for them. And if anything, it's only gonna hurt them more. If anything, I would say make an amendment to this bill and have it so if somebody is self-employed, and I am as well, so I can really relate to this, but I'm on the opposite side of life here. I'm the one collecting the paychecks. My ex is a W-2 earner. Um, so I think that if somebody struggles paying their child support, that if anything, you would give them somewhat of a grace period for 60 days to make up that amount that they could not pay. So putting a, a date on there for, say, the 15th, whether they're a self-employed employee or not, it really doesn't matter. Um, and, and the other part that I really have a hard time with is um, the Department of Child, uh, Child Support is so quick to pull somebody's driver's license if you do not make that date. And the sad thing is um, that is preventing them from paying it and will set them back even further. Um, I've been sitting at the um, courthouse listening to these child support cases because I'm very interested in how this stuff happens. And they are very quick to put a criminal penalty on these people that mi miss that one day. And they're not looking at it as, okay, this is a self-employed person rather than somebody that's a W-2 earner. So I feel that um, putting these dates on, again, is very irrelevant because if you're dealing with somebody that makes $150,000 a year, they have no problem whether they, the date's on the 1st or the 15th. Um, so in my case, yes, this caused quite a bit of strain on my family financially. And my ex, even though he is a W-2 earner and he was supposed to pay it on a certain day, he paid what he wanted when he felt like it. So the dates were very irrelevant for him. And the gentleman that spoke before me made it so easy to sound like, oh, just go up and ask for another date. It's not like that. It is very contentious. And me, above all people, can tell you, I've been in the court system for nine years, and I still don't have an order on my child support, um, basically for the arrears. Granted, again, I had three bad judges, so it really is not um, helpful in that case. But I think that this would be very dangerous to families and individual, <coughs> sorry, individuals where if you start putting these limitations on them and put in certain dates, 
again, I don't think that they need anything. Are you willing to take questions? You're starting to repeat yourself, yep, so and that's good. I mean, it's good that you said what you did. Yep. But uh, would you take any questions? Absolutely. I see none. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. And also, I do have um, a couple of handouts here because. If um, you could give them at the end of the table and pass them down. Absolutely. Thank you so much. The chair now recognizes Matthew Hayes. It lists you represent the Department of Health and Human Services, OBCSS, Bureau of Children, Childish, Childhood. Thank what? you, Mr. Chair. I uh, got most of the letters. The, yes, the Bureau of Child Support Services. Got it. Uh, so I'd just like to say uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the House uh, Children and Family Law Committee on behalf of the State of New Hampshire and uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Bureau of Child Support, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about HB 126. Uh, I am a staff attorney for the Bureau of Child Support. And I'm also the legislative liaison. My name is Matthew Hayes. Um, the Bureau of Child Support um, is essentially uh, created out of the child um, Title 40 in the Social Security Act of 1975, and is charged with the responsibility of enforcing child support orders in the state of New Hampshire. Um, I'd like to just uh, bring out a few uh, statutes to the committee's attention that might conflict with this bill. Um, by way of definition, uh, child support arrears represent the amount of child support that remains unpaid. It is owed either to the family or the government. Um, when a family applies for public assistance, uh, such as TANF, uh, temporary assistance. Could you quote, since I have the statutes here, would you be willing to quote them as you read them? Yes, um, I can. And I also have a handout that provides one of the ones I'm going to talk about the most. Uh, I have a number of copies I can leave here that everyone can look at after. But um, essentially, uh, I'm talking a little bit about um, arrears because this statute does appear to be placed in a statute that talks about public assistance. So um, I was addressing that generally in our situation, when we enforce cases, the arrears are essentially either owed to us um, because a child support order accrued mm -hmm. during a time where an obligee was receiving TANF assistance, in which case those accruals would belong to the state. But uh, in particular, I draw the committee's attention to uh, RSA 458, excuse me, B4-3, which this statute essentially deals with uh, wage assignments, and in particular that provision uh, deals with the amount that's withheld. Um, when an employer is withholding child support, uh, that employer must withhold a sufficient amount to meet the obligation, the ongoing obligation, as well as uh, an extra 20% that goes towards payment on arrears. Um, so I think that has to be read to show that um, when the employer takes the money, that employer doesn't really ha have an option to uh, bifurcate, you know, oh, this is going to be applied to the ongoing support and, and this will go apply to TANF arrears. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure when I prepared this testimony. I know there's a couple different directions I thought maybe this could go. So I'm just trying to provide the committee with some general information about where I think conflicts might exist. Um, I think in particular, the committee should be aware of also in that same statute, 458B6, uh, this, that provision deals with uh, employers and requirements of employers. In particular, paragraph four, requires the employer to send uh, withheld amounts immediately mm -hmm. to the payee or the department. Um, they're not permitted to just uh, hang, collect it at a certain time of the month, uh, almost maybe in, in, in escrow, uh, and then provide that at a later date. They have to immediately pay those funds when the employer receives them or when the employee receives them. Um, I also have a, a quick, I have another statute I want to talk about, but I don't know if it would be easier to take a question or if the, if the committee's finding what I said already helpful, but. Before you do, um, is it your testimony that the bill before us 
um, should have been placed in 458B rather than where it is assigned here? I think it would be problematic. I think that what the bill is trying to accomplish sounds to me problematic with the whole structure of the payments in general. Um, it seems to conflict with how wage garnishments work, and it does seem to conflict with how accruals of the child support work. Um, and the other statute I was going to talk about was the nature of the child support order itself. Um, all child support orders in New Hampshire are judgments. Um, and according to a different statute, uh, RSA 461A14, all support payments ordered or administered by the court um, under this chapter shall be deemed judgments when due and payable. So the Bureau, as at this point, isn't taking a position necessarily uh, for or against. I just put neutral on my card and hope that's okay. Um, I just think that some of these statutes definitely seem to apply, um, and it seems um, just sort of they don't mix very well with structuring a date that's due on at the obligor's choice on the 1st or the 15th of the month. Um, so I, I'm just going to conclude as far as my written testimony. I, I do have that I can submit. Um, I'm happy to take questions, and I've also included my card on the information so anyone can contact me at any time. Representative Long, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, now, my understanding from a bill last term that there are some court orders that don't have a date. You're ordered to pay $145 a week. Um, and as my understanding is there, well, well, are you of that understanding that there are some court orders that don't specify a date? Um, the court order, the uniform support order, um, essentially, it doesn't provide an exact date. Um, what it would do is it says the effective date of this order is, um, you know, to January 17th of 2023. That's the first, let's say that's the first date that the order goes into effect. And somebody is to pay $144 per week, I think that's what you said, um, effective January 17th, 2023. Um, today's a Tuesday, so essentially every Tuesday that will be an accrual. Um, that obligation becomes due on this date. Um, okay. And, and uh, follow up? Oh, my apologies. Oh. Follow okay. up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, are, are you aware that some people that are getting the child support have a difficult time because it's sporadic, so it's not a specific date? It's you, you get it one month at the first week, you get it another month at the third week, you get it another month at the second week. Is, is that – are you aware of that situation happening? Um, unfortunately, you know, wage garnishment is the preferred method for collecting child support. Unfortunately, when there uh, is not a wage garnishment, for example, if somebody is self-employed, it's it's difficult. You're relying on them to make the payments, and if they don't, um, there's certain enforcement remedies that can happen. If it's payable through us, um, parties are certainly willing to file motions to contempt if it's not payable through us. But um, yes, unfortunately, some people do not make payments on time, and without a wage garnishment, it's sort of on them to make them on time, and that doesn't always happen. Just one more. One more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it's not a matter of not paying support for the month. It's just a matter of paying at different times where the recipient of the child support is getting paid at different times. So this month I'm getting paid on the first week, the next month on the third week. So there's, it's not consistent. It's not that the person paying is missing the payment. It's the day that he pays. So I'm asking you, I, you know, you said that this bill would be problematic. I'm asking you if that would suffice. If you pick a time, uh, that would be cons that would draw more consistency. I, I just feel that there already there already are due dates, and this I guess uh, spells out. You know, once a month, like you could already have a court order that it accrues once a month on the first of the month. I mean, parties could agree to that, and then 
on the first of the month, they owe eight hundred dollars, um, and then they have to pay it. And then if they don't, there's certain things that can happen. But um, that's how I that's my understanding of how the court order works. Um, you know, it's it's a judgment essentially, and and it's payable when due. Thank you. Representative Raymond. Um, thank you, Chairperson, and um, thank you, Mr. Hayes, for being here today uh, to explain this to us. Can you, I ask a question in a little bit broader context? Could you tell us, please, um, how, approximately, um, how many uh, of the cases of child support, like what's the ratio between ones that are wage garnished through your office versus you know people having just a court order and working it out because as I'm reading this I'm confused as to how as to whether or not this bill would affect the people who are being wage garnished or only people who have like a direct payment system uh, I mean I, I think that thank you for the question uh, representative I don't I'm not sure and are you, if you're looking for numbers as far as how many cases we have wage garnishments out as far as how many cases we enforce I'd have to get those I don't know I have them off the top of my head but I I think there could be a way to do it. Um, I, it sounds like, and again, I, I don't want to presume something in the bill. I'm, I'm just sort of um, not sure exactly how it fits in based on where it's been placed. Um, but it, I don't want to be repetitive, but it does seem to conflict. I mean, the money, if you have a wage garnishment set up and it's, whether it's um, a TANF case or a not TANF case, the employer um, is told um, by our, our bureau that if this person gets paid bi-weekly, this is how much you take out. This will help cover the ongoing support and it'll help go towards the arrears. It, it sort of happens a little bit separate from the way in which they accrue. So sometimes an accrual will happen and then it just so happens an employee gets paid you know, the next week. So as long as the payments have been coming in every month, then they continue to be in compliance. It's almost like they're sort of, it's just a couple different ways, it's a couple different components to the payments in, in the child support world. Thank you. Representative Greg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'll be quick. And thank you for taking my question. So what you're saying is there's no, according to what the information that you have, um, there's no set like it has to be on the first it's kind of individual judgments so maybe making a law where it's one of two dates could complicate it sorry i'm just trying to wrap my head around all of it um i think it i think it could complicate things especially if a court would order that the payments are supposed to be weekly um the court might order you know in the in, in the best interest of the child that you know i think the payment should be 144 per week so in theory the, the obligation should be getting paid 144 dollars per week um, so there's, there's that practical aspect of it. Um, I have a question. Isn't it really your department's concern that you take money in and pay money out and the specifics are really between the parties and the court system? The department is basically just the bank. Uh, that is, we, that is part of a role. And I think that, um, I think the issue where it gets complicated is if this does conflict with wage garnishment statutes, those those wage garnishment statutes are mandated by federal law um, CFR. And I'm not saying this seeks to change that. I'm just saying if there are conflicts with the way in which the department is able to get money to the obligees. And again, this this was placed in the public assistance portion mm -hmm. of the statute. So that was another reason why the Bureau had to be here, um, I think, to help explain where our thoughts are. Okay, I've just read the support section 461. So it maybe should have gone there. And that's not a question, but it should have been. Representative Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hayes. Um, back some time ago, uh, when the federal government came to us and said, you're going to have to do wage assignment or you're going to lose $21 million, um, we did come up with an option, which was to allow people to have, some, I can't remember, the checking account or some kind of account where a person put their money in and then take it out, thanks to our vice chair, Randy Lyman, at the time. Is that still in existence? Uh, I think parties, if you, uh, thank you for your question, sir, um, Representative. 
yes, people can waive out of wage garnishments um, if they're if the court orders that's in the best interest of the case, and there's provisions for that in there, and we are able to um, have a part of our department essentially take the money in and, and provide it to the other the obligee. So yeah. there's certainly many cases where we don't uh, have very little involvement in the case, other than taking the money in uh, and, and dispersing it. To your point, Mr. Chair. Thank you. For example, is it to your point that liens are mentioned or the requirement of a previous payor to go on food stamps? And again, that is really not your concern as long as the department gets the money that it will then expense. Um, am I correct in assuming that you, the department, does not actively do the liens on property or the legal requirements of getting food stamps? Uh, I'm not sure about food stamps, but I know for liens, if, if there's an order payable through us then, and we're charged with the enforcement of that order, then liens are one of our enforcement tools, and, and that's something the department would do. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And you had some stuff for us, I think you said. I do. Would you like me to? Yeah, yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. On a co sponsor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Uh, to the committee. My name again is Deborah DeSimone. I represent Atkinson Rockingham 18. When I saw this bill uh, and spoke with the sponsor of the bill, I did a little bit of research and one of the issues or a few of the issues that hasn't been brought up yet so far is um, the consistency of payments, whether they be through garnishment of wages or personal pay. Uh, it has been brought up uh, and the discussion has been made concerning the fact that somebody could get their child support on uh, January 2nd but then not see it until February 28th. So this would create more consistency but w one of the more serious issues I think is that there are many times where your child support payments, if in the case of garnishment, uh, goes to um, DHHS and uh, you get paid on the 15th, but they're expecting your payment on the 10th. And in the interim, you apply for a passport because your employer is sending you to another country for work your passport will be denied because you're behind on child support. In the case of a, a similar case, you uh, apply to renew your driver's license and your uh, driver's license renewal will be denied because you're behind on child support payments, even though your monthly uh, salary, bi-weekly, bi-monthly salary or whatever is garnished. So I think we need to take that into consideration that this bill could create more consistency and people who are up to date on their child support payments would no longer be considered delinquent. Thank you for your time. Does anyone have any questions for the representative? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As much as I had hoped we could go to an exec session on this, the ranking member and I both um, are of the opinion that the prime sponsor might wish to check with an attorney to see if what he requests could be cited differently. I wrote down the RSA numbers here if you want them later. Um, it does seem to me to fit better there, and it might um, not lead to the confusion that some are, I believe, having by it being way in the front of the book. And so we're going to hold on to this, and uh, 
come back with um, some perhaps different sightings. So thank you. And that closes the hearing on House Bill 126. And now I open the hearing on House Bill 108. And although he needs no introduction, I'm supposed to do it. Representative James Spillane. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee again. Um, this bill is one that I worked hard on the last term uh, with the director, or is it commissioner, of DCYF. Um, we amended it. We amended it again. We came up with language that really worked well. We got it passed through the House, and it stalled in the Senate and ended up retained while they looked into things. Um, but this was done with the agreement of Division of Child, uh, Children, Youth, and Families, DCYF, to try and place in place at least um, a penalty for making false claims to DCYF. As things stand in the state of New Hampshire, I can pull a fire alarm and I can get charged for it uh, if there's no fire. I can make a call into the police with there not being a real threat, and I can get charged with that false claim. But I can call in on my neighbor because they threw trash on my lawn and say they're abusing their kids, and there's no penalty, even if I did it maliciously with bad intent to try to get DCYF involved in their family. There's no penalty at all. There's nothing that can be done. So the big point of this bill is that we did not make the bar easy to get over. It's a high bar. It says that they must make the accusation uh, maliciously and with bad intent, with intent to harm. So there's agreement that there would be very little chance that a first time person who was concerned about a, a child and did call would ever get charged with this. But a person who repeatedly calls and makes false complaints that they can actually make the, the, the proof in court that the person did it maliciously and with intent to harm, um, they could be charged with this so that it could serve as a deterrent from people making false accusations and using the department um, as a weaponized way to get back at a, an ex or another family that took uh, custody of the children temporarily or what have you. Um, so the first part of the bill simply says that um, the first around line 10, you'll see that it says that reports made to the department may include the name, address, or phone number. Originally, I had wanted to get rid of all anonymous reports. Turned out not a great idea to make that jump forward. Um, but let's, let's um, try to discourage anonymous reports whenever possible. So um, we're leaving it up to the person taking the call at DCYF to, to ask for that information if they want to. And if the person is, is really adamant they want to do it anonymously, they can still do that. We did not change that at all. We've just put in the ability that they, they have written here now. They have the ability to make an, a reminder. Uh, I was told last term from the um, uh, director of DCYF that uh, the staff that takes these calls is few in number. And they tend to get to know certain people who are repeat callers. So they can remind them that there's a criminal statute once this passes and say, do you really want to make this complaint? When they know, when they recognize the caller as somebody who's done, been a repeat caller um, for unfounded cases. Um, but that is also a may. They don't have to tell them and make that reminder. It just gives them the ability to ask for that and to make that reminder. The only thing that's that's set in stone here that must be followed is the fact that it is now, as if you look at line 22, we're adding the fact that it will be a misdemeanor to knowingly make false statements of suspected child abuse to the department, to any court, to any law enforcement agency, or to any social service agency, or to any mandatory reporter of suspected child abuse, any person who knowingly or in bad faith makes a false report of suspected child abuse may be subject to those penalties. So it, it has to be made with bad faith, knowingly, you know that it's a false accusation, you make it anyway, and that's when this would kick in. Aside from that, we've preserved every 
ability for somebody who has the slightest inkling that there's abuse going on to be able to make that call without any fear of charges. It's only for those bad actors who have shown repeatedly that they've, they, we can now prove it in court. And that's it. Representative Panic. Thank you, Chairman. How can you prove a false claim? Preponderance of evidence. Um, as I said, this would never apply to a first person because you can't prove that somebody knowingly made that that false accusation the first time. But um, I have had I have a constituent who lives in a part of the state, not in one of my towns, but has reached out to me last term when this was going on, has been going through a divorce for over three years and was getting calls for child support, uh, from Division of Child Support, uh, uh, DCYF, every two or three weeks because the separated husband's new girlfriend was making calls in to try to sway the divorce process by getting on record that there's an abuse going on. So in that instance, it's repeated. There's proof that it's happening. They were anonymous, but I have no doubt that at some point the department could put together a pattern and identify the, the numbers that their calls are coming from or some such. There's no reason for them to try to put that pattern together right now because there's nothing they can do. There's no way they can charge somebody from repeatedly making a false accusation. When this statute passes, they now have the ability to investigate when those abuses are taking place. And this isn't just about, geez, it's kind of annoying to have DCYF called on me every three weeks. This causes emotional turmoil in the family. It causes trauma traumatic damage to the children that are involved in it um, because they get pulled out of bed in the middle of the night so an officer can look for wounds on their body. And this also takes away vi vital resources from DCYF that they could be putting on other things. Now, in a discussion with uh, the director last time, I was told that because of our um, increase in the opioid problem, one of the problems they're finding now is that a lot of placements are taking place with the grandparents. And you run into a situation where this grandparent's upset that that grandparent got custody and this one didn't. So this one's making calls to DCYF about that grandparent because they feel they should have had custody instead. And the system is getting weaponized and there's nothing that can be done by the state to stop it at the moment. So I'm asking that you give serious thought to passing this again. We passed it last year. We didn't get it through the Senate, but I have every confidence that this year we can get it through the Senate and we can put a stop to the abuse in the state. Representative Raymond. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, um, Representative Spillane. Um, I've worked in a state that has this statute. I worked in New York for DCYF there. Well, it's a different agency, but it doesn't matter. Um, my question is regarding um, the part of your bill here where it says uh, may be subject to criminal and civil penalties. So who are who would be tasked with investigating whether this was maliciously done, um, maliciously or falsely, knowingly falsely reported, um, and then how does one um, approach this in the civil court? So I, I'm envisioning police, in my experience, police have gone out and done it. Good question, good question. Um, the thing we wanted to allow was that uh, such as in the instance of the, um, the divorce situation where the claims were being made repeatedly and disrupting the lives um, of um, four children and a, and a mother, um, that there was some ability for her to civilly recover damages after that criminal charge was proven. So that's in there so that if it's proven by the investigation of the department and the police that this person has made these uh, repeated false accusations and is guilty of the misdemeanor, that then that opens it up to a civil complaint that can allow that person to recover damages, um, whether it be counseling costs for the children because of the incident, um, lost days at work for the person who was injured by the, the calls made against them that were false. Any of that could be recovered civilly to allow them to try to recover some part of, part of normalcy in their life. You're welcome.
Would you believe that as a mandatory reporter the, and the employer of several others, we take dropping a dime on people very seriously. And it, we really agonize about when somebody did fall down versus something else. And we take it very seriously. And um, speaking as both a mandatory reporter and the employer of one, I appreciate the restraint that you put in here. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The chair recognizes Keith Koenig. I'm going to say Waypoint. I started to say Warpaint, but I decided, no, that's Waypoint. I'm guilty of horrible handwriting. I will admit that. So I I've seen worse. <laughs> Probably from your doctor. You think. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, good morning. Uh, my name is Keith Kinning. Um, I'm the advocacy director at Waypoint, and I sit in opposition to this bill. Um, life is about balancing. Um, we have a balance here that we're trying to figure out, correct? We're trying to balance how do we protect children and get people to call in when they think something is wrong versus a law that apparently is being used in some occasions, as the representative said, as a weapon. And so how do we find that balance? Um, in New Hampshire, we are all mandated reporters, but most of us don't know what abuse and neglect is. And so when we see something happening, we're, we are tasked by the state to call in and report something. And I think what the representative said, and I agree with two words, um, you don't want the law weaponized, but he's talking about the deterrence that will happen to the people that are making the false claims. I would ask you to look at from the point of view of the deterrence that could happen from people that are afraid to call in because they are hearing that you can be charged with a misdemeanor if you make a false report. And so I, I guess what I'm saying to you is if we started telephone like we did when we were in fifth grade and we started here with Representative Bickford and I talked about the bill and I'd say you have to knowingly make a false claim and you can end up with a, um, a misdemeanor, I bet by the time it got down to Representative Seidel, probably what people would hear was that if you make a false claim, you can be charged with the misdemeanor. And that is my fear, is that people will start to hesitate when it comes to calling in, rather than just calling in and letting the department decide which um, cases should be followed up and which shouldn't be followed up. Now, in this state, the vast majority of cases are unfounded. There are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of phone calls that happen in this state every year. And a relatively few end up as founded cases. And so we have decided as a state, we're going to err on the side of letting people call in to make sure that these kids are protected and letting the state go from there. Um, so I guess the one part that I would ask this committee is that if you decide to go forward with this bill, I would recommend that you remove the misdemeanors. If you decide you want to have civil penalties, that is, that is in, in my opinion, a far better way to go than people in the community hearing that if they somehow make a false statement, and I know the word is knowingly, but if people don't understand that and they hesitate, we won't have people calling in protecting the children. The civil penalties are, tend to be less intimidating than a misdemeanor charge would be. Um, but again, this is a balancing act, and um, I would ask the committee to consider that as we go forward. So I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. Question from the chair is that in those states that have this bill on the books as a law, has the number of people calling in significantly plummeted? Yeah, thank you for the question. I can't answer that for you, Mr. Chairman, but I can look into it for you. I can, I can look in to see if, if that is true or not. Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in your opinion, could, could um, civil action be taken currently or does it have to be put into statute? I mean, if somebody put a false claim on me, could I civilly go after that person? I guess, thank you for the question. I wouldn't want I wouldn't want you to hang your hat on this, Representative Long, but I mean, it would seem to me that if you're continually 
being told someone is saying something negative about you that is false, that's a defamation under the law. So I guess under a civil penalty, you could do that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if I was to go to the police and make a false statement, I would, I would be charged. If I went to court, I'd be charged. However, is, is there actual immunity in the statute? I, I thought there was, but I can't remember. Is there immunity under this chapter from people making false statements? Um, or, could they, or could they be actually charged for reporting falsely? Well, thank you for the question. I don't think currently they can be charged. I think that the, the problem becomes is most of us don't know what the definition, we don't know the legal de definition of abuse and neglect. Yeah. I think, Representative Bickford, this is what I'm afraid of, is yeah. that one day you see a child standing out waiting for the bus and they're standing in the rain I, and you and you call in and I, nothing happens. Do you mind if I continue or do you want- well, I, 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 I understand that. Uh, I, I was here when we, <laughs> when we passed this. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I continue? Let him continue, no, no, please. No, no. Is that right? Well, and you call in and nothing is done. And then you call in and see in a week the child is standing out there and they're standing in the rain and they don't have any coat on. And then you call in. And then the next week you see them standing out in the rain. Now, all of those may have been found unfounded by the department at that point. But if you're calling in multiple, multiple times because you're seeing things that are happening, and this is what usually happens with somebody that's a neighbor, um, are you going to be, at some point, is somebody going to say to you, well, you, you've made multiple phone calls in here. There's never been a founded case. And so we can we think what you're doing at this point is knowingly making false statements. And I think that's what I'm fearful of, is that people will start to hesitate as they see accumulated data of nothing's happening. That could be the fourth or fifth or sixth call. And we, we have seen this on multiple occasions. You know, I mean, people call in, things don't happen, people don't, and then finally the child's arm is broken or something happens along those lines. And if your first, first thought is, I'm going to get into trouble, you're going to hesitate. Your first thought should be under our law, I got to protect this kid. And so, again, that's where I'm fearful that with the, the public not understanding what knowingly false statement means, you may have people hesitating to protect a child. And then what's the cost of that? And that takes us back to the balancing. What is the cost of doing nothing? What is the cost of doing something along these lines? which may deter people on one end from making false statements, but also may de deter people from calling in. That's not my decision to make. That's your decision to make as a committee. I just wanna make you aware of it. And I think particularly the criminal misdemeanor charges could be very significant in deterring people from calling in and, and, and protecting a child. To what degree are you familiar with how much the uh, principle of intent is in play here? knowingly make a false statement. Uh, would you expand on intent as perhaps putting the brakes on rampant runaway uh, fear? Well, intent is just such an important part of criminal law. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can be pulled over by your car and you don't have to be intending speeding and you can get a ticket. That's a part of the law you don't have to show intent. Most, right. cr most criminal laws, there has to be intent to do something. Um, and, but again, I think, Representative, what I'm going back to is, first of all, you're going to be asking the CPSWs to make a determination whether they thought that those statements were made in good faith. And then my question comes back again is, if a person is making multiple reports with good intent, but the pattern looks like they're trying to harass someone, how do you determine mm -hmm. that or not? And so that's what I was talking about, the telephone game, which is by the time it would get down to the end here, I'm afraid what people are going to hear is, if you make a false statement, you could be charged with a misdemeanor, and that would cause people to hesitate. So that, that is my concern. Also, you earlier said you were searching for a definition of child abuse as it appertains to this. I don't, I, thank you for the question. I don't remember saying that. Okay. I, it, I'm saying most people don't know. If okay. you stopped 100 people on the street, I don't think the majority of them what, would know what abuse and neglect is. Most people in the state know that they're mandated reporters, and so the system is set up so that if you think, if in your definition, in your opinion, you think abuse and neglect is happening, you call into DCYF. That's what the, the point I was trying to make. Okay, because it is defined in statute. Yes, no, I'm saying the public. I see. I would say the, if there are over 10,000 phone calls a year that are made on abuse and neglect into DCYF, the vast majority of those people 
probably don't know what the legal definition of abuse and neglect is, but they think they know. They're, they're, they know they're mandated reporters. Most people in the state know this, and so they default to calling in early rather than waiting too long. That, that was my point. I don't know if that answered your question, Mr. Chairman, or not. I think so. Mr. Chair, I, I was going to do a follow-up, but you got ahead of me. Oh, I'm sorry. Representative Bickford. Thank you. For a well, follow-up. Our, our uh, researcher has aptly and quickly pointed out to me that um, 169C, colon 31, immunity from liability. And it says it, it's pursuant to a good faith report. It's not any report, but a good faith report. So Tent. my question had been about knowingly uh, false statement, not about the child with a, without a code being reported that's a good faith report mm -hmm. so the concern of the people who brought this bill forward i would say was knowingly that somebody is abusing the system the abuse system mm -hmm. and what can they do and, or what should we do that's it yeah as i said and i, I don't thank you for the question mr bickford i i, I represent bickford i really do think that people that are using this law to bludgeon a spouse or an ex-spouse or um, a neighbor is just completely incorrect. Um, I would ask again that the committee weigh the advantage of people not hesitating to call in versus people hesitating to call in afraid they're gonna be charged with a misdemeanor. And that's why I would recommend that if you're gonna go forward with something like this, that you at least take the misdemeanor part out and you could leave in the civil penalties. Seeing no further questions, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Chair calls Vivian Gerard, and she is promising me two minutes. She was up to three at one point and wonderfully overwrote it for two minutes. Let's see if you can do it. So I was trying to respect that. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm talkative too. So um, thank you um, to the committee for having me up here again. Um, again, my name is Vivian Gerard. I actually have a 14 and a 16 year old daughter. So this bill actually um, really says a lot about my case. Uh, but during my divorce in 2014, the court ordered a GAL um, and the GAL actually tried to pull my children away from me because of a false police report. Um, divorce with or without children, as everybody knows, is very stressful anyways. Uh, the GAL has many influences on the future of our children and is unnecessary in many cases. Uh, the GAL did not check out any of the evidence in my case and it didn't even come from any credible sources, change the outcome of the case. When child ser services came out, everything was unfounded. And to be honest with you, I agree to a certain degree uh, with this bill that um, Representative Splane had put together, but I think it needs some amendments to it. Um, I felt that it was very biased and we did not have equal visits with the GAL. Uh, no one was looking into the false police reports. The fees that should have gone into like an account uh, with the GAL, they, because the GAL knows who's paying, it, it sways one direction or the other with the parent. So if the person that's paying more, um, the other parent is in a um, disadvantage. Uh, we could not speak up until the case was closed, and by then it's too late, you lose your children. Um, I was accused of child neglect, and an investigation was done, and based on the cl claims from the undisclo uh, undisclosed confidential reporter, my case was um, all to avoid child support from my ex. Undisclosed individuals can have pr profound effects on your case without the accused ever having the opportunity to defend against it. There is no consequences or recourse, so I'm kind of glad that this bill is in place. The problem I have is it keeps saying, you may have consequences. Um, and the und undisclosed person can essentially give free will to someone to taint an entire parenting case. And it's usually simply over money. Um, and to be honest with you, um, in my case, I was fortunate that I did not have these outcomes, but I did have a false police report against me. Um, I did have child neglect um, complaints against me based on medical um, because I couldn't afford all the co-pays to take my child to the doctors. 
they came in and di they did well checks. Children could, the, they said because it was so many, the children could, could not even be left upstairs in their room at five and seven years old. Time to bring it to a close. Absolutely, and I, I was just finishing up You're here. doing great. <laughs> so I just wanted to um, bring this point that if these medical, these mandated reporters actually did their jobs, then other people would not be putting in these false claims. So if a, if a mandated reporter actually saw that there was mental abuse, there was child abuse or anything else, these mandators would probably have more weight on a false police report or a false reporting in general. Thank you so much. Will you take a question or two if sure. there is any? I don't see any, so thank you so much. Okay. Again, I'm gonna pass this out in, um, in relation to, I, yep. I, I actually put in other bills related to this as well. Thank you. The chair recognizes Kate Shea. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, committee. Thank you for having me. I will try to stick to five minutes. Nice to see friendly faces here. I am a mother I'm here to testify in favor of House Bill 108. I am an IT professional. I deal in IT, but also process improvement. A uh, mother of three with autism, one has a serious neuroimmune condition. We are the type of family that um, led me to become an advocate in this state. I'm not paid, I'm a volunteer. At a little time I have at night, I'm on Facebook and I'm trying to help people in support groups. So I represent an army of people behind me. Um, when you live the life of a family of children with complex needs, and we have a lot in this state, we have kids 36,000 plus with an IEP in this state you find yourself in the crosshairs of a lot of different things. One is that you start to struggle, right? Your family struggles, many of us end up in divorce. This brave young lady behind me, I commend her for her story. Mine is very similar to that and what led me here today. There's no place to go for resolution. The courts and the jail didn't care in our case either and they side with one party. They look at who has the money. It's a very upside down situation and all of what you think is true that you go to great lengths to document suddenly turns into a report that's completely the opposite. Um, and so one side uses the process as a weapon. For us, it happened twice in the case. So when I hear things like, these are not good faith reports, these people are making these, they know that they have to be made in good faith. I mean, this is stated, if anyone reads up on these kind of complaints, they must be made in good faith. So this, the, the people that do this, that call in these complaints are often obvious, repeated complaints, they are done knowingly to cause harm and harass. So in our case, schools and neighbors, someone who doesn't like you, we use it as a weapon. For us, two or three times, it was that happened to us. Um, and I'm not here to tell my story. It's really long, and I have a book in the process. But um, I'm only here to say that you know, other, oftentimes last year we came and we testified, and people said, oh, that's a terrible story. You know, I'm really sorry that happened to you, but I can tell you I'm not alone. Again, the Army is behind me, and they're all working hard today, and they couldn't be here, but they know about this, and they're behind it. Um, these are examples of families that are the most at risk, the people who need our intelligent care and support the most, like mine. When you inform the school nurse after months about your child getting a surgery that was discussed with the IP team, and they turn around and they get snippy and they decide to call it in because you inform them the surgery is next week and the child be out of school. There is an example right there, a completely malicious complaint. Um, or you're dealing with IEP struggles and someone decides, oh, you don't like the tutor we gave you? Okay, we're gonna call in a complaint. Your kids look unkempt, no basis, right? Um, you're in a divorce, they call in complaints. The ex-girlfriend's nudging the ex-husband to call in a complaint. You, you know, you can get away with this. I have people that are up there in Concord I'm connected with. In our case, that's really the fact. And all of these are unfounded. What, meanwhile, you're trying, to you're trying to deal with what this lady was saying. You're trying to keep your head above water. You're trying to pay all the bills. You're trying to keep your kids healthy, go to school, fight the IEP battles in my case, try to keep one alive and literally sitting in a hospital room getting a phone call with my child's near death and they're saying, the school nurse called this in because you sent an email proactively telling her your child be out of school next week because she thought she needed medical records, <laughs> which is not her right to ask for. So you're guilty until you're proven innocent. You're accused 
of actually helping your child in many of these unfounded cases. Other states that we talked about have a warning, as we know, and that's what this is built upon. And the funding, what I'm getting to here is that why process is important is because last year we sat here, gave the same testimony. Commissioner Ribsham was here. He was actually seemingly in favor of this, that we need to do something. Process improvement costs nothing. Adding more staff isn't going to fix this. So, you know, when you look at family law, you look at the other things that come up criminal law, you perjure yourself, there's a consequence. There is absolutely no consequence here for this giant catch all. And in a day and age where we're telling everybody out there, to see something, say something, people get their 15 minutes of fame or they use it as a way to hurt each other in a very real and obvious way. These are not the not in good faith case. These are, these are absolutely done and they know what they're doing when they make those calls. Um, the price that we're paying for this is, is it's actually priceless. So it's the cases like Little Adam, Little Harmony. We don't have the right process in place to catch those situations, but yet we can catch people that are actually good upstanding citizens and put them to the point where the parent feels like they're gonna have a heart attack over the stress they're going through because they're trying to save a child's life and then they have this on top of that. That is why I'm here. And so as far as people saying, it's not my decision to make, you know, we don't we worry about missing somebody. There are processes, there are laws in place today for that. Um, these are people that don't care. They don't care about the law. They're doing it regardless and they're gonna do it whether in family court, they could be guilty of perjury. They're still going to do it. So there needs to be some teeth. And that's what I'm asking for you to do is put some teeth out there and don't make this one big catch-all because the process is not going to correct that. It's going to hurt people like us, people behind me, and the harmonies and the other kids get missed all the time. And I'm representing this as a child of a caseworker. So I know a little bit of what I'm talking about. I know about process and I know we can make this better. So thank you. Representative Petrigno. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Certainly. If I heard your testimony correctly, I think I heard you say that schools and neighbors use it as a weapon. And I think you made reference to a uh, nurse using um, this as to make malicious complaints. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to know if this you think is a, uh, a pattern, something that happens frequently and if you think that nurses as medical professionals mm. are seeing it, that they're doing their due diligence. Thank you. That's a good question. It's complex and it varies case to case, I think. You know, in our case, the school situation was an obvious one. Um, you know, when you're dealing with children getting an IEP and you're trying to get supports and services, you're not always the best friend of everybody on the team. And in her case, it's a personnel issue and that should have been dealt with by the school. I tried to do that, but they got very angry with me for even suggesting could have been, it was very obvious the person that it was. And you'll see these things redacted or blacked out. You, you can tell if you're a smart enough person by reading the records who did it. And I do think there's a pattern with certain people. In her case, if I was in charge of her, I'd be looking into has she done this in other cases. There's a fine line, you know, where she's crossed between it being um, her, her mandatory reporting responsibility and her being for lack of, I'm sorry for any Karens in the world, in the room, a Karen. And she's going up way beyond her scope and she's using it to hurt somebody. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but each case can be a little bit different. I do think there should be mandatory reporters. I mean, I consider myself, if I look around, I've sat in a parking lot and wondered about a child who's crying and I sat there and kind of observed and I thought, you know, I don't have all the pieces to this situation. So I'm gonna make the right choice. I'm not gonna do anything. But you know, if I see that again, Maybe I'll ask, I'll ask a question as a citizen. I talk to the parent, you know, but I'm not gonna make that jump to conclusions. So I think there's a way it can be done, but um, I don't know if that answers everything you're looking for. Any additional questions? Thank you. Thank you. It seems to um, the chairman and vice chairman that we're not ready to proceed to a vote on this. Um, so we will be adjourning the hearing and taking it up at a later date. Um, we are adjourned till one o'clock and
I might suggest this. I got to run over next door, but it might be a good time if people would uh, like to have lunch with people you don't know. You know, form some uh, inter-party bonds and so on. But we're back at one o'clock.
Welcome to CFL. If you think this is the Canadian Football League, you are in the wrong room. This is actually, uh, what's this called? Children and Family Law. And I open the hearing on House Bill 151, a establishing a committee. Now, before I read any further, there is uh, a word that comes down from the enchanted forest that says kill, kill. They don't like committees. So I suggest that is not the 11th commandment, thou shall not committee, but instead it could be a good vehicle to get intelligent um, ideas floated and policies and so on. So the compromise was Pearson, you round up the people who will be appointed to these things. What they didn't know is I love it. But my little hook on this is with the consultation of the bill's prime sponsor. So together, should this bill ever get signed into law, we will have our people already lined up. It's a deal? Good, you don't have any choice. Establishing a committee to study the issue of unmarried cohabitants, domestic partnerships, and common law marriage. Representative Maggiore, please come up. Good. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And uh, it sounds like this bill's ought to pass. I appreciate that. I'm leaving. It's chairman, but uh, will you, any objection to it going on consent? Uh, no objection, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you in all seriousness. Um, Chair Pearson, members of the committee, I appreciate your time and attention to introduce House Bill 151. Um, this is a bill to study the issue of unmarried cohabitants, domestic partnerships, and common law marriage. For the record, I am Representative Jim Majori, representing Rockingham District 23, the town of Northampton. Uh, the bill was, this bill, the same bill, was introduced by colleagues from the other body in two, in the two previous legislative sessions. In 2020, SB 602 was voted ought to pass from the Senate Judiciary Committee with a unanimous 6-0 vote. It subsequently died a COVID death in the House. In 2022, SB 291 was voted ought to pass from the Senate Judiciary again with a unanimous 5-0 vote. That year, the vote out of the House Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee was inexpedient to legislate by a 12-8 to 8 vote. The bill died in the House on the floor by a vote of 179 to 143. One of the reasons I, uh, for the ITL might have been, as the chair has just said, a caution against a multitude of study committees. And I certainly respect the, uh, the continued caution on study committees. And therefore I say, Mr. Chair, members of this committee, that the co-sponsors on this bill, Representatives Murray and Balboni, as well as Senator Waters and I are already willing and able to commit to the work of completing the study of this issue should we be appointed? And I do know that all the representatives and senators that I've named have said they are willing to go do the work. We might need to find a Republican or two as well. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> Duly noted. Uh, so I am asking for an ought to pass on this bill. The majority of U.S. states draw a sharp legal line between cohabitation and marriage, attaching clear and important rights, benefits, and responsibilities to the latter but few, if any, to the former. Common law marriage is formally recognized in just eight states, Colorado, Iowa, Kansas, Montana, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, and our great state of New Hampshire. A common law marriage is a legally recognized union between two people who have not purchased a marriage license or had their marriage solemnized by a ceremony. Domestic partnerships recognize the union of two people but differ from a common law marriage in that the domestic partnership is a union moving forward, effective from this day, for instance, while a common law marriage is more commonly retroactive. We recognize the partnership as a result of time. Unmarried cohabitants live under the same roof. There is a common law marriage exception in New Hampshire under RSA 4, excuse me, 457 colon 39, which gives a spouse share of the estate of a deceased common law spouse. But for the exception to be valid, the couple must cohabitate, that is, live under the same roof, 
for, um, and acknowledge each other as husband and wife for a period of three years. And that's an important distinction. You will hear testimony today of the devastation that can occur when a couple is, for all intents and purpose, in a common law marriage, yet gaps and silence in state law render surviving members of the relationship helpless in the wake of life-changing events. If two people are in a committed relationship, they might be expected to contract. This is some of the uh, argument that was made in the last session. A legal marriage creates a reciprocal contract between spouses, including benefits of an estate and responsibilities for care upon death. And we commonly call this type of contract a will. In a recent Gallup poll, oh, my nose is running. Can I borrow a tissue for a second? <laughs> Sorry about that. For health reasons, it has to be a gift, not a loan. <laughs> okay, I accept the gift. In a recent Gallup poll, only 46% of married couples have a will. Results have been similar in three other polls on the same question since 1990. We cannot assume all the reasons why a couple will not create a will, but we can be sure that committed couples, both married and those unmarried in domestic partnerships and common law marriages, may put themselves at some risk. A study published by the Pew Research Center discovered that more adults in our country are delaying or even foregoing marriage altogether. Between 1995 and the time of the study in 2019, the share of adults who were legally married declined slightly from 58% to 53%. Yet over that same period, the share of adults who were living in an unmarried, li excuse me, living with an unmarried partner more than doubled, rising from 3% to 7%. According to U.S. Census data, the U.S. marriage rate hit an all-time low in that same year of 2019. For every 1,000 unmarried adults in 2019, only 33 got married. This number was 35 in 2020, excuse me, 2010, and 86 in 1970. This decline in marriages and rise in cohabitation might pull us into a conversation about morality and the sanctity of marriage. It is very possible the lack of law nationwide on this matter relates to a principled view that marriage creates stability. It is possible that legislators nationwide may hold that common law marriages and domestic partnerships are potentially unstable and susceptible to fraud. But it is interesting that cohabitation is more likely to function as a substitute for being single, not being married, and therefore more a function of a loving commitment than rather devoid of it. The testimony following mine will demonstrate that cohabitation, common law marriages, and domestic partnerships can join two very committed people in a loving, stable relationship. And those relationships may produce equally committed, loving families. There are laws that protect children born into common law marriages. I, this study may explore those laws, but the focus of the study is more likely to, to center on the rights and responsibilities of, the re of adults. That's a supposition on my, on my behalf. For instance, what happens when one of the people in those committed relationships dies prior to producing a contract and there is no next of kin or the next of kin are estranged? If assets are legalized under a business from the deceased, does the surviving member have rights and responsibilities for the benefits or dissolution of the business? What happens if the estranged members of the deceased fail to assume the responsibilities for the disposition of the deceased's body? This study will examine the rights and responsibilities of people in those relationships who experience a multitude of very regular, common, and often tragic events for which our state law is either silent or where there are gaps. I thank you very much for your time and attention, and of course, I submit to questions. Do you have a copy of your written testimony for our files? Mr. Chair, I have, and I have submitted it to the clerk, both in hard copy and electronically. Any questions? Representative Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just can't resist. Um, where are you trying to go with this? I wasn't really clear on that, uh, where we're headed. You know, you trying to get people married? Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. You, you know, you, 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 you are um, somebody that creates marriage parties? Or? <laughs> no, sir. I, I thank you for the question, Representative. And where we're trying to go when this was this issue was first brought to my attention and you'll hear testimony from the person who did that 
it, it presented the what ifs to the legal side of this. By the way, I have no, I, I, my, my, uh, I do not uh, get people married. I, I have no business in that whatsoever. This is a constituent that brought this up. When I entered this room, I heard from somebody who had the polar opposite uh, circumstances in their life where they were actually considered cohabitating, but the law created such problem. There was gray area in the law such that it created legal problems. We're looking at this from the legal side of where do people stand? Now, I, I won't suppose that I know how exactly to do that yet, but we're going to bring in whatever parties are necessary to help us find that gray area and close any gaps in the law so that we can both protect people who are, well, not both, but we can protect people who are in these kind of relationships. Excuse me. I, I, I feel you should have brought those forward, those issues or problems that you want solved. Uh, due respect, I think you'll hear that in the testimony that follows. Okay, thank okay. you. Sure, thank you. Your advocacy is to set up a study commission, and you're, you're giving a big overall view of the picture, not necessarily making any recommendations. Is that your purpose? Correct. And, and Mr. Chair, um, uh, and, and I know words are important, I think, but would certainly welcome the, the recommendations of the committee, uh, of this committee, that a committee might be better simply because it is smaller and we might have a better chance of being able to bring in the professionals uh, who can help us with that. If this committee thinks a, a larger commission is the better route, I'm open to the wisdom of the folks. Uh, we don't. I, I yield. <laughs> Not because of the quality of the people here, but because a working group that can be mobile, um, I know from experience, can get a lot more done a lot quicker. Then recommendations can come back. Thank you. Not because we're not quality here. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Chair recognizes for three minutes, Vivian Gerard, three minutes. She's proven she can do it. Rule one of testifying is what? There we go. <laughs> well done. Sorry. Um, thank you. My name is Vivian Gerard, and I, I'm the owner of Timber Post Bed and Breakfast. And as many of you heard prior, I've been dealing with a really bad nine-year divorce. So I'm very, very against marriages or the government getting involved in my life. They've proven that they've done nothing but caused damage and left damage behind. So first, um, I know that you had, um, Chair, that you had said that you'd like some recommendations, and I actually have some along the way. Um, that can be handed over to this committee that's going to be established. Perfect, because I could be that, rep that Republican that could be on the study if you'd like. Anyways, um, part of this is um, if somebody was going to get married, automatically they go in and apply for a marriage license. Wouldn't it be kind of a great idea if somebody had an anti-nup where before you get put in the situation of divorce, you already walk in there knowing, okay, I'm bringing this to the table. If something happens, I'm taking that back with me. Or as they get further in their journey, they can add different things and they should go into this as a business contract. So when you're working with property or whatever the case may be, kids, at least it's talked about when you're level-headed and not when it becomes a big contested divorce. So everyone, um, as I said, should, should be, that, that goes in for a marriage license should be forced to take a pre-marriage class. So you know, as any other contract, you know what you're going into this contract, what you could lose and what can change. The way life is now, um, they don't communicate the, the parts of divorce that will affect your life in this way. And the government's role is to help protect parties with their health and welfare, not to really sit there and divide their assets up 
of unmarried parties. May I suggest we're getting somewhat off topic. This sounds like an opening salvo for the committee when it meets. We are here to speak to the merits or not merits of establishing the committee. Well, and so can you make that point? So, so the point that I'm trying to make is being somebody of divorce, I know what is affected personally in, in my experience. So having this study certainly helps bring other parts of this to the, the government here. And if somebody has a single status, they should be able to remain single. And one last thing that I want to touch upon um, in, in my experience, because I do rent out rooms, um, in my situation, I lost alimony by having a renter. And even though I had a rental agreement, the judge waived the rule and decided that she was going to make up her own decision on it. So whether I, you have somebody in three years living with you, you might enter into a contract that you don't even know that you've entered a contract into. The We've hit our time. Okay, and, and one last thing that I'd like to um, leave you with is, you know, having the three-year window, and they, they talk about it being a lover, a friend, a roommate, or whatever the case may be, with everything changing from man, woman, now it's changing to persons to be shut up. legit. Um, in my case, because of renting out, this cohabitation bill the RSA um, could certainly harm people like me or not even have protection of a, for the deceased. Thank you. Will you take a question if there be Absolutely. a question? I don't see a question, so thank you so much. Okay. Now, Spanish is fungilo. Italian is fungillo. Uh, I don't recall this in when I lived in England. So, Beth, would you come up, please, and help us? We are multilingual in this committee here. Um, Mr. Chair, with, with your permission, may I join uh, Ms. Frangilio up here for moral support? It is apparent you have done so. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. I'll go back to my seat at your suggestion. Uh, well, we do have time, but I'll waive that. Thank you. And you are Beth? Frangelo. Frangelo. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Beth Frangelo. Thank you all for letting me be here today. In brief, I'm here to share a short story of two people who lived our lives as husband and wife. On October 27th of 2021, I got a phone call that Mark had gone into cardiac arrest in my driveway. Upon arriving to the hospital, I was told that he was on life support and they needed to take him off and it was my decision to do so. Would I please come in the back room and do that? I did. In the meantime, I called his two estranged brothers who he hadn't seen in well over 10 years or spoken with very much except for when his mom got cancer in 2018. The two of them showed up after I spent some time with the medical examiner, about 30 minutes, answering questions about Mark's life and our life together. Once those brothers showed up, I no longer had rights. The medical examiner turned his back to me. He only addressed those brothers who came out of the woodwork, and I could make no further decisions for Mark. They were asked what Mark's final wishes were, and I had to let them know he wished to be cremated. They didn't know. They didn't have an answer for him. They were asked, is he an organ donor? They said, I don't know. And our friend, a priest who was with me, said, yes, he is, and we have his license to show it. The medical examiner continued to address these two brothers who hadn't been around in all these years and knew nothing, and I no longer mattered. So from there, we left, we went back into the room, spent some time with Mark, the brothers left, um, our friend who's a priest spent some time with Mark, and we left the hospital. That night I got a phone call from the organ bank that the brothers had signed his body over to me. They wanted no part of his organ donation or his burial. So from there, I took care of the organ donation. I called their bro his brother in the morning and said, I need to go to the funeral home. Would one of you be willing to come with me? They said no. Upon arriving to the funeral home, I was told because we weren't married, I really didn't have a right to bury him. If he has next of kin, I have no rights. So after a long talk with the funeral home, 
he was able to come up with a law that covered abandonment and estrangement to allow me to give him a proper burial. From there, I sought counsel because I didn't know what to do. What are my rights? We aren't married. And do these brothers have rights to everything? And apparently they did. Our businesses, our bed, our everything had to be turned over. And so I asked if we can have this conversation. Can we find those gray areas? Because I don't believe I'm alone. I'm an assistant town clerk for the town of Hampton. And I can tell you two stories of exactly what happened to me, happened to others. One was a 25-year-old girl driving to New Jersey to get married. And her fiancé was killed in the car with her and her baby. Her and her baby came in our office to register a car, and she couldn't because his name was on the title. She didn't even have a right in the state of New Hampshire to get a death certificate. She's the mother of his child, and she can't get a death certificate in the state of New Hampshire. There are far too many of these stories, far too many, that I think we at least should have the conversation. Let's find those gray areas, and let's help people, because I'm not alone. And I don't think it's right. So I ask you today, please, to support this committee in going forward. Thank you for your time. And thank you so much for your sharing your story with us. We appreciate that. You. You're right. It is more common than one would think. Any questions? Thank you. Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you. Close the hearing on House Bill 151, and with the agreement of ranking member, I open an exec session on the same bill. Remember, the bill before us is not to make any determinations about changing laws. The bill before us is to set up a study committee that will bring forward recommendations, which at a future date will probably be LSRs that some of us turn in. That is what is before us to establish a study committee. The chair is open for a motion. Uh, what is your motion, Representative Bickford? Is there a second? Motion dies for lack of a, a, a second. Is there another motion? Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll move uh, OTP. Is there a second? Second, Representative Perez. Now, now discussion. Hand? Yes, Representative Bickford. Is your microphone on, sir? I feel there are bright lines. I'm very familiar with the uh, subject at hand. Um, you, you either are married or not married. The only thing I've seen uh, that would be questionable is uh, common law marriage, which doesn't happen until after you're dead. After you're dead, someone can make a claim that they uh, lied about your situation and claimed that they were married to you and then they can go after your estate. I think that's wrong. That, that's the only thing I can see that needs to be changed. Um, otherwise, in situations uh, like the lady that spoke to us, um, you could be dating someone and claim, well, you know, this is my person that I want to take care of, but you have to have uh, agreements between each other. Um, I take... Um, to try and make some kind of changes. I, uh, there's just too many of us in this world that want freedom. And I, that my concern is having people try to stuff uh, marriage down our throats. Um, I know it's kind of strong language, but uh, I'm not married. I've never been married. And I've been with the same woman for 35 years. So I'm more successful than most people that have been married. And uh, we don't want to be married. We like what well, the agreements that we've made. We don't want to go to court like Miss Gerard. We want to stay out of it. And we can do that with our agreements. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm opposed because of the direction I believe this is trying to go in. I want freedom. 
uh, Representative Perez. I believe this is necessary. To be honest, especially in a lot of uh, communities, this is common, common to live without being married. But a lot of times, there's no paper saying that you've been living with this person for so many years and that you have the same rights as someone is married. And then you can lose everything, everything. And I believe this committee uh, will help a lot of us to understand the consequences of, of you know, the issue that uh, the test, uh, uh, the person uh, who testified just brought up to our attention. It happens a lot. And I see it happen a lot, and especially um, in uh, underrepresented communities. And that's why I think it's critical for us to have it, uh, a study committee in this. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Anyone else wish to speak? Representative Gregg. Um, unless I'm mistaken, I don't think this is trying to shove marriage down people's throats. I think it's trying to protect people who have also chosen not to get married. It's a conversation um, you know, that I've heard a lot, especially in the times, the health uh, concerns that we've had the last few years that have um, you know, seen younger people and you know, do we have to be married to have this? And, and certainly you know, for this last woman that testified, it compounded um, her entire grief situation when family was able to come in. And a lot of times we do have family estrangement. Um, you know, I, I think it's more actually protecting a situation like yours, you know, where you haven't been married for, uh, but you've been together 35 years, that, that union and what you guys have built should be protected and it shouldn't have to be on. Um, so I think a study figuring out exactly is there a need here because we've now heard, you know, at least one case where, um, you know, it, it was very impactful. Thank you, Representative. Anyone else wish to speak? Representative Panek. So the way the, I just looking for some clarification. So the way the laws are written now, if you're cohabitating um, or you're in a common law marriage, that if you had your partner pass on, an estranged family member can come and take away your house, your car. Is that how it is right now? We actually don't ask that I, question. I don't know who I'm supposed Usually. to be asking the question to. I'm asking you. Or anybody, anybody in the, the board. committee who might know? Yeah. Representative Vickford, do you know? Well, that, that's that's your property. I mean, it's your house. Um, we own a house together. Her name on it, my name's on it. Then you make a decision whether it's going to be in common, or uh, or, or survivorship. Um, like say, a will will give you your rights. You don't need anything. This, you don't want somebody. How I want to say it. Um, if you want to be married, you can be married. There's nothing says you can't be married. That's what gets me. Go ahead and get married, and that then these problems that you think are going to happen to you are not going to happen to you. But I own. Like I say, a lot of property of my own, and then we own property together with both our names on the property. And you'll do that even if you're married, you'll see it on there. But there's, there are homestead rights that go to married people, but we're all aware of those things. You know, We work with lawyers, and we know what our rights are. We actually do have rights as single people. So this is almost like a prenuptial agreement. Oh, I'm sorry. It's different. Representative De Simone, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question of the chair. If you have access to the common law marriage statute. That's next Christmas. Okay. And I don't see my Thank committee you. researcher there. Do I can take this testimony from uh, someone in the audience if you have that statute handy. What was the question? I didn't. I may, Mr. Chair. I just have to go through the verify. That's it. fine. I will come back to that Thanks question. Look at this.
I apologize for the time spent. This talks about cohabitation, not common law marriage. It doesn't answer your question it, particularly. I believe that's what it is in the statute. Why don't we uh, give you a few minutes to continue to read on, and we'll see if there's anybody else who would like to uh, say anything. Representative Raymond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so there is no um, common law statute in New Hampshire. Um, if you did a search in the New Hampshire RSAs, you wouldn't find common law. The only thing that's referred to is cohabitation. Um, so currently in New Hampshire since 1842, um, you have to be married in order to get that automatic death benefit. Um, if you're just cohabitating and you don't have a will or property in both parties' names, it doesn't go to the other, the surviving party. Um, so when we have people who are uh, living together in a committed relationship, whether they have children or not, um, they are considered two single people residing in the same home. They are not considered to be a couple in any legal way in New Hampshire. Um, children allows for property to transfer to the children, um, but not to the parent of that child without any other will or legal proceeding. Um, so at this point, I don't think that this um, study is asking us to pass any bills to do any of that. To me, it sounds like the study is to see who, uh, like, what's the commonality of, um, or how common is this practice in New Hampshire, and is there a need for any legislation to address it? And I don't think we can address the question of whether or not legislation is needed unless we study the issue. Um, so. For myself, I am in favor of studying the issue, seeing what the committee comes back with, and then at that point, um, discussing through public hearing and, and through executive session whether or not any legislation is warranted. Thank you, Representative. Representative DeSimone, did you find something? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I did, and I found what I thought I would find because I, I was under the impression that New Hampshire does not have uh, and does not recognize common law marriage uh, except extended to the co cohabitation issue. Um, and, and that's what I thought. And I don't want to make a, 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 I don't want to vote based on a thought. I just wanted to have the actual proof. So in this, it discusses um, common law marriage, and there is no such thing or statute in the state of New Hampshire. Um, so I thank you for indulging me. So, so do you think a study of this would be helpful or warranted at least? Considering the fact that um, people should be more um, in tune with the consequences of the decision-making process and the fact that um, they should seek legal advice before they jump into something like this. Um, I, I'm not really in favor of another commission. Okay. Uh, Anyone who has not yet committee. spoken? Then Representative Bickford, you may have another bite at the apple. Oh, oh. Frau Grossman. Frau Grossman, I was delayed. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a thought that comes to mind, in order to have a will and to have these legal pieces in place if you're not married, you have to have access, you have to have money. You have to have money to get these legal services that will put things into place for you. Um, so just want to throw that thought out there that it, it affects maybe potentially couples that don't have access to that, but want their freedom. I seem to understand or remember at least that on many agreements, two parties can do it and have it notarized. And this has been in place for a long time because of the very a fact that was mentioned that many people, especially young couples, do not have the money for lawyers. Anyone else with anything um, before we get on to the vote? 
uh, excuse me. Yes. I just wanted to add that there is such a thing that was, we've seen as pre neutral or anti, anti neutrals. And the Supreme Court has said that they have a higher standing than a um, contract. We often hear, I often hear people talk about contracts. Um, you know, the common law thing, as we call it, it is in, there's a lot of case law on it, which mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. looked at extensively. So I, um, I do want to point that out. And as far as, as um, the cost of a lawyer, it's a lot cheaper to go to a lawyer before you make a mistake than it is after you have to get a divorce lawyer. Oh. Um, and one last thing is I'm concerned that we're, that we're doing these execs without looking at what people have sent us remotely. As you recall, I was looking to try to get in so I could find because remote gets cut off at noontime. So people are sending us information from outside, and yet we may not ever have looked at it. And I would say it's important to us what people have to tell us. The motion before us to establish a committee to study the issue of unmarried cohabitants, domestic partnerships, and common law marriage. The motion is ought to pass, made by Representative Long and seconded by Representative Perez. Would the clerk please call the roll? Representative Long. Yes. Representative DeSimone. No. Representative Bickford. Representative Nelson. Bickford. Mike on and yes or no? No. Representative Nelson. No. Representative Ball. No. Representative Panic. No. Representative Seidel. No. Representative Grossman. Yes. Representative Levesque. Yes. Representative Perez. Yes. Representative Greg. Yes. Representative Raymond. Yes. Representative Petrino, the clerk, votes yes. Chairman Pearson. Has everyone been called? I believe so. McMahon was called? No. Oh, McMahon, I apologize. Okay. I'll vote yes. McMahon votes yes. Okay, I'm missing, and Representative Pearson um, votes yes, primarily because it's just a study committee. So the vote is nine, yes, six, no. The motion passes, ought to pass. And uh, who will write the committee report, which is the majority report? Representative Long is pointing to someone. Oh, Representative Long is volunteering. Okay. Okay. And uh, someone may wish to write the minority report. That is nothing the chair organizes because the chair organizes the committee, which is the majority. So one of you who wishes to, uh, who voted no, wishes to write the minority report. Um, just hand that report to me. You'll have to discuss it amongst yourselves. We have a four minute break coming up. And both reports I will need to have by the end of the day. Um, they're going to be talking amongst themselves during the break. This ends the, uh, the uh, exec committee on House uh, executive session on House Bill 151, and we have a four-minute recess before the next bill with the six people who voted no caucus amongst yourselves, and one of you let me know you're writing the minority report. Peter. Peter. Yes. You, you have the uh, form. Oh, yeah. Committee report yeah. form. Yeah. 
Sure, you may. Would Debbie D. Simone please come to the front? Not with reluctance. We love a cheerful giver. Thank you very much. What are we going to do? Oh, hang on. That is out of my control. Open the hearing on House Bill 218 FN relative to court rules and transcripts in the Judicial Branch Family Division. Representative J.D. Bernardi, prime sponsor.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and committee. I'm J.D. Bernardi, Rockingham 36, which is Hampton Falls, Kensington, Newton, Plastow, and Southampton. I am from Southampton. I am on the Science, Tech, and Energy Committee, which is also meeting right now, so I'm dispatched for this purpose. Uh, as the sponsor of 218, I would like to point out that basically the bill addresses three problems. One is the waiver of court rules. Two is the ability to create recordings and transcripts. And three is the ability to use those recordings and transcripts in the appellate procedure. Now, turning first to the waiver of rules, what are we talking about? This is rules regarding courtroom conduct, rules of evidence, pleadings, testimonies, representation, discovery, depositions, interrogatories, appeals. There, there are over 50 pages of rules, and uh, I've given you a handout. The very first page is an extract from the rules, and I want to point you to Rule 1.2 which is for the record it's what looks like it, this it's it's this is this document where it has the squiggle in between 1.2 and 2.2 uh, which indicates there's a lot of rules in between <clears throat> um, so 1.2 basically allows the court to basically disregard or waive family court rules 2.2 allows the court to waive all the rules of evidence of the New Hampshire court system. So imagine you're going to court for the first time, you're dealing with a court, uh, a, a court issue, and all the rules are pulled out from underneath you. The rug is gone. You are going to hear several people testify behind me of the specifics of this, of this problem but indeed it is a problem, it does exist, and it's only fair, we believe, that we set court rules, we have them for all the other courts in the, in the state, and we follow those rules. And they may be waived, as, as the, the uh, 218 uh, provides here, with respect to fees, in your executive session, you may say uh, maybe they ought to be waived for some other specific purpose. If you do that, I my only comment is identify a very specific reason why a rule may be waived. Otherwise, this general waiver which exists in 1.2 and 2.2 is an anathema to the judicial process. With respect to recordings and transcripts, the next several pages of that handout deal with this issue. The first is a request for proposal from the court system for digital auto rec uh, recording systems. And I want to point you uh, to page three, number at the bottom, uh, where um, it is going over the business requirements of the scope of work of this digital system. The very last item, item I, in the middle of the page, says software must be compatible with touchscreen kiosk mode, which would allow for standalone use of audio recording functions and features. So <clears throat> this, this is basically asking for a system where we do not need court reporters, we do not need any other functionaries in the room. We can just have the bailiff or the judge or whoever manage this system and it's all done digitally. In, the, in principle, nothing wrong with that. However, if you look at the next uh, series of pages, this is a the request for proposal vendor uh, questions to the to the court. What is it that you want? And I ask you to look at uh, their response to 2A, which is found on the very next page after the RFP. Um, and it says, if not reporter deck, what are the hardware requirements of the touchscreen kiosk uh, m uh, mode device? Answer, all-in-one uh, 
Dell PC running Windows uh, 10 with kiosk deep freeze by Varionic software installed. This is for the courtroom that that do not have a courtroom monitor, court assistant, clerk to run their court. It's instead to have only a bailiff to start and stop the recording. So this could be the bailiff or it could be the judge or it could be someone else, but a single uh, single person dealing with this. Then I ask you to look at item 16, which is on the second to the, is on the last page, the first, the the, uh, the front part of the first page. Um, as a summary of our questions, this procedure appears more related to services as opposed to software licensing. Um, there are cloud transcriptions, there are even interpretive services that appear to be part of the procurement. If this is the case, please state this and we will make our decision uh, to respond based upon the true nature of the uh, procure procurement. I go to the bottom of the answer. It says the goal is no is to have no long is to, is to no longer have court staff manually upload an, an, uh, audio recordings to the transcription service provider, end the manual transcription back backup recordings to CD, and have an automated process for the court to receive its portions of the funds collected by the transcription service. The last page the back is a uh, is just a, a simple ad um, and I point you to the right hand side the FTR gold player and the third criteria the audio channel uh, isolation and foot pedal control so this is a device that can be used in this recording system such that a foot pedal can control when the recording is on and when the recording is off. And it can be done by one person, could be done by the bailiff, could be done by the judge, could be done by whoever is close to that foot pedal. Now, why is that an issue and why are we asking for um, recordings and transcripts? You are going to hear from various parties to uh, judicial proceedings where the transcripts and recordings do not contain the full information that happened in those hearings. Information adverse to the court or adverse to one party has been deleted and the consequences are significant for the other party. So this bill simply gives all parties the opportunity to make recordings and transcripts and then if they're going to be used in any appellate procedure I have to point out where they differ from the official recording and transcript of the court and they can carry on their case effectively so I ask you to listen to the, the testimony of those that have been adversely impacted by court records that do not reflect what actually happened in the court and consider that this is a, option, a very simple opportunity to, for the, those litigants to remedy that situation. I'll be happy to take any questions. Representative Raymond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you for coming to bring this to us today. Um, I have um, three questions and uh, one is kind of background information um, and the other two are specifically regarding your um, proposal here. Um, and the first one is under the current system, um, if an individual, a party in one of these court proceedings feels that the official record does not reflect what actually happened, what is the current uh, recourse that that individual is able to take? They, they only can bring their, their case. I mean, what they, they don't have any evidence. They don't have a recording because they were not allowed to take a recording. Uh, and so they can, they can make their statements and they can have witnesses if there were any other members of in, in that hearing that were there, but generally those are very, uh, 
audiences that are very constrained, so, right. so the opportunity is generally very limited. So generally, they're out of luck. Okay. Um, and then if I can follow up. Thank you. Um, and then the other questions I had um, are regarding uh, the part of your proposal that would allow uh, individuals to take their own audio or one would assume video as well, recordings in not, these? Not video. Video is not allowed in the courts. Okay. That's what I was curious whether or not you wanted to allow that. So their own audio recordings. Um, the first part of the question is um, how does your bill or how could your bill provide um, a chain of custody so that there is not the possibility of any tampering with those audio recordings? And the second part of the question is how can this bill ensure the continued confidentiality of children's both identities and disclosures during family court proceedings? So the first part is a, a chain of custody of the recording. Right. How, how can the court be assured that these recordings that um, lay people who are involved in these processes have not been edited or altered or um, changed in any way um, or that they've remained in the possession of the only the person who was in the room. Um, and then the second part is regarding children's confidentiality for both their identity and any disclosures they might make while they're testifying. So the chain of custody question is, is, is interesting. I, I, I mean, I think normally the, the reason you have a recording is because, and, and what you'll, you'll hear testimony about is in the, in the court reportings where things have been removed, you'll hear a click of the recording going off and a click when it goes back on again. So in a recording where that is, does not happen, you're not going to hear that. Now, uh, I, I don't know if that is going to be adequate evidence. I mean, this is something that the, that the appellate court is going to ha basically have to address as to whether they believe the integrity of that recording or not. Any other questions for the representative? Yeah, well, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. She also asked a question about uh, uh, children's uh, identity. Um, if you may I may restate your question, Representative yes. Nelson. Uh, Representative question. Raymond. Raymond, Raymond, thank you. Raymond. Yes, so the, the second part of the question is currently children who are involved in family court proceedings um, have a right to privacy. Their identities and any disclosures that they make on the stand is not um, accessible to the public um, and it's required even if you look at the, you know, the court cases are, they're not identified by name, they're identified by initial, um, to protect their privacy. So how would your bill ensure that lay people coming in and making their own recordings are not able to release that information to the public and maintain the privacy of children who may or may not be victims. So you're saying re the presumption of your question, if I get it right, is that this recording that's done in in the hearing w would be released to the public as as and a court record would not be, and and hence there's going to be some disclosure of of the privacy information. How does one prevent that? Yes. I in principle one one can't however I do not believe that that is normally the the circumstance uh, that's that's being addressed here normally um, children are not allowed into the into the hearings most times um, because they're not allowed to be witnesses um, and and so it, it, it doesn't strike me as a reasonable activity that someone would want to take this recording and then take it to the press. The purpose is to document the record so the, in an appellate procedure you, you can truly um, make your case for what happened in the court. Representative Nelson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, my question relates to lines 13 and 14, um, where it says the appellate court shall review the differences in recordings and associated transcripts and so on. Um, who, what, uh, what level of person or what um, job in the appellate court, um, whose job would it be to review those differences? I'm sorry, uh, my assumption it's going to be who's ever sitting on the bench on that, on, the, on that day. I mean, they're looking at, whoever's looking at evidence, this is just another piece of evidence, just like any other piece of evidence. Um, Follow up? Uh, no, thank you. Representative Gregg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Um, so I just, I guess I have a question. When the court is recording right now, there is no law that's requiring them to record like a certain amount or anything, like to say this entire thing has to be recorded. So there's nothing right now holding the courts who would be an official recording to record the entire thing? Well, they have to record the entire thing in principle in order to make a transcript of what's what happened in the court. If, if a judge is not behaving appropriately, and that's generally what's going on here, um, th and they want to um, make some comments that they don't find very acceptable to be on that transcript, the button is pushed, the transcript stops, the comments are made that are adverse to a party or or adverse to the judge if it was heard, and, and then the button is pushed and, and the and this, uh, recording goes on. So that's what we're trying to protect against. We're trying to stop or identify a way to deal with misconduct. Can I follow up? Would it be more prudent then to have a law that would require that the judges, because I, I worry about having a bunch of different people for the reason of, um, and I have seen quite a few cases where children testify, especially in the family courts, um, you know, worried about their privacy. Would it, would it not make more sense to have something that would, instead of, you know, letting people kind of, you know, record at will or whatever in there and a bunch of different people, um, to require the courts to have the entire thing recorded because you know start time, end time, and so you'd able to know if anything had been redacted or anything. Would that make more sense? If you had faith that that was going to actually happen, that's fine. But you, I, we started off this uh, discussion with the rules. The rule 1.2, we, we just, we can waive any rule of the family court. Rule 2.2, we can rule all the rules of evidence. They're just suggestions. So I, that's part of the problem here is, is what is n reasonable judicial conduct is not always being followed in that court. Thank you, Representative Bernardi. And we will dismiss you from further speaking, but not <laughs> until we first hear from Representative Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Chair. I, I'm sorry, I may have missed part of what you said, but the gist of it, I think, is you want, you're looking for a backup system, aren't you? So Essentially looking for a backup for basically people to prove that the, the court system has behaved inappropriately. And we have, if you look back in our records recently, we have a lot of problems in the family court. I mean, I, I, I might just make a statement here. I, I, I'm on the Science, Tech, and Energy Committee. I'm an engineer and pharmacist and, and, and the drug development. Uh, and, and so this is not my area of expertise. But I ran to be a representative for the people of New Hampshire. And my constituents are saying, we have got a major problem in the family court. Constituent after constituent, it's a problem. We're being mistreated and the evidence is being hid. Now, there are cases where this has come out, but it's an ongoing problem. 
that is the fundamental underpinning of why this legislation is being proposed. Thank you. Now, thank you. Thank you. We've got some people who want to testify and uh, got a couple of folks who promise to be brief. I'm going to hold it to you and please make sure you are actually addressing the bill before us. And uh, for three minutes, she asks, uh, Katrina Heinrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee. My name is Katrina Heinrich, and I am in support of HB 218FN. I support it relative to the court rules and transcripts in the Judicial Family Division. In my experience, in over a decade of court litigation and fabricated orders, this bill addresses three of the most egregious and significant problems that are consistent across comparable cases. The family court acts like a business instead of a court of law by omitting due process, creating unnecessary financial hardship, and dismissing the rules of evidence. New Hampshire Rule 2.2, as the esteemed uh, representative just pointed out, that's the rules of evidence. They do not apply in family court. Um, <clears throat> for over a decade, I have personally been citing zero due process in my case as they were churning out fabricated orders. Court orders are anchored in fabricated fantasy. Yet, over a decade, the orders have unnecessarily protracted the case, intentionally involved third-party private contractors that were unwarranted and damaged and harmed my children and myself. The court orders are not based in reality or fact, and therefore are artificially manufactured to achieve a specific agenda. These orders without evidence violate due process, but even more egregiously, carry the weight of consequences, lifelong, life-altering consequences for those that are being victimized by the court process and the resulting orders, usually the non-offending litigant and children. The second and the third thing I want to address is the court transcripts cost and recording accuracy. Transcripts are the only source for litigants to appeal fabricated orders. Written transcripts are beyond reasonable for the typical litigant with a hefty fee schedule. Transcript accuracy is at the discretion of the court. Transcripts have testimony and courtroom behaviors missing without proper law citation or justification for the missing testimony and room behaviors. Transcripts, missing testimony, and courtroom behaviors typically show a large segment of time missing with an accompanying word of pause. This indicates that the live recording is being stopped and started during the court process, therefore not an accurate and true accounting of the court. I do have an example that I attended another, another person's um, hearing, and this happened to be with Judge Foley, who happens to have a standing computer desk. You can see his hands, his feet, the entire process. During the hearing, Judge Foley tapped the foot pedal and the keyboard area. He proceeded to verbally bully and belittle the litigant. When the litigant was finally able to get a copy of the transcript, the pause segment, intact, had been activated and the entire court behavior was missing. With over a decade of myself being forced into the family court, my examples of missing testimony began as early as 2007 in an assault trial prior to my divorce. With this brief summary of experiences, House Bill 218 not only addresses these distinctive issues, addresses the lack of due process, the organization of a business entity, 
that engages in third-party associations with private contracted guardian at litems, therapists, transcription companies, collabority, forcing litigants into protected cases, financial distress, void of due process. And I know the representative gave you the request for proposals paper, and I'll again close by referring to the last sentence on number 16, and really the last part of that sentence, which is, they want an automated process for the court to receive its portion of funding collected by the transcription service. So funding and inaccurate reporting seems to be the main purpose of the court. Thank you for your testimony. Do we have any questions? I see none. Thank you for your testimony. I do have copies. If you could pass them around. And the chair recognizes uh, Vivian Gerard. Again, three minutes, she asks. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman and members of the board. Um, as many of you know, my name is Vivian Gerard. I've been in this um, um, here testifying today, and I'd like to take the transcripts separate than the court rules, and I'll and I'll you'll see where I'm going with that. So, as I had mentioned, um, I am self-employed, and as uh, Katrina had mentioned to you, the cost of audio when you're going through a court battle is twenty-five dollars per CD. I had 27 hearings and nine to the Supreme Court. We rely on the transcripts to be correct. The outcome of your case is heavily, heavily viewed based on those transcripts. And um, what I want to bring to your attention on the handouts that I'm going to be given to you is I have a Judicial Conduct Committee that shows how much stuff was changed based on the judge. The judge can do whatever they want. They do have a button that they can turn on and off. And it took many, many transcripts for me to show that I was bullied by these judges and two of them got thrown off the bench. And one of the, actually there's been a few comments, but one of them specifically is reopening a can of worms. Um, it was viewed by the Judicial Conduct Committee, and they heard the audio. I have all my transcripts, all my audios, and there is nothing on any of my transcripts, but I remember hearing it in court, but there was nothing on any of my documents that showed those that these comments were missing. But then once it was reviewed by the Judicial Conduct Committee, this judge was reprimanded for not only just saying all these condescending items, but also the fact that these were not on the transcripts. The JCC cannot provide me that audio. So that's what I want to talk about with the transcripts. The court rules um, is another situation. This binder right here, I brought this in. If you guys would like a copy, I'd be more than happy to make you a copy. This is what happens when the judge makes up her own rules. I went to the Supreme Court, and these are all the rules that the judge deviated without any reason. There was, she did not have any good um, t uh, written information for me as to why she changed her mind. And one specifically is the child support, which I created this, the state law. And she said, my kids did not deserve child support. So why is she changing the rule, which was the law, which I created? Why is she changing this rule, saying that I don't deserve it when the Supreme Court keeps remanding it back to the local court? You have 20. I'm pretty much done. But I just want you to know that no matter what happens, the judge can make up anything that they want. And this is true evidence of what they do. Any questions? 
I'm sorry. Very, very briefly. How yeah. much is it for the a The chair CD? recognizes okay. Representative Raymond. Thank you, Chairman. How much did you say it was for one CD of your hearing? So one CD is $25. That's for an audio CD. Okay. That's not the written transcript. So when you go to the Supreme Court, they request a written transcript. But in order to make sure that they're correct, you got to listen to the audio and follow along with the transcript. Uh, follow up. One follow up. Do you also have to pay for the transcript? Yes. And how much is that? Um, Dana? <laughs> Did she say um, 17? Thank you. So $1,700 for two days of testimony. Okay. It's very, very expensive. And uh, seeing no further questions, the chair recognizes Mr. Justin Nadeau. Rule one of testifying is <laughs> turn on the mic. That's quite all right. Good, good afternoon, Chairman Pearson. Nice to see you, and good afternoon, Vice Chairman Fong, and honorable members of the committee. My name is Justin Netto, and I'm a lifelong resident of New Hampshire. Um, I've worn just about every hat you can think of, you know, attorney, counselor, uh, professor at UNH for many years, inventor, businessman, colleague, um, brother, son, uh, friend, even best friend, if you can believe it. But no title has more significance than daddy. And, and that is the hat that I'm wearing today. I'm here as a daddy and as a concerned citizen. Um, <clears throat> I was raised to believe in our country, just like all of us, and our system of justice. And our system, our family court system, is more, more than just fractured. It, it truly is. Uh, I, when I saw this bill being proposed, I was, I was delighted. I really was. I was very, very happy to see that this was being proposed, and I was compelled. I've never been before a committee before. I've never testified, and this is the first time. Um, there are m numerous documented in incidences that, uh, over the years, I've served as petitioners' counsel, as representative uh, respondents' counsel, and sadly, I'm in the middle of my own divorce presently. Um, while there's a numerous, there are many, many instances I could cite. I just want to just leave you with this: uh, the transcripts, the recordings are vital. They're crucial to cases. Uh, especially when you're dealing with an appeal. Uh, one example I can just give you very briefly is, uh, you know, a judge's level of judici in, injudicious conduct. I am lost in a sea of adjectives because it is beyond description. Um, and the, the audio, I had requested the audio. I received the audio recording back. Uh, the judge had a complete... Um, meltdown uh, and said some of the most horrible things I've ever heard and um, had he, he had uh, the judge had then looked at the court reporter and said were we on the record and she looked at the judge and she said judge we are on the record and the judge immediately departed the courtroom uh, I had requested the audio and I believe the, the other counsel had requested the audio and the audio abruptly shuts out shuts off just prior to the meltdown and it's not just that that wasn't captured within the audio, but also significant substantive issues were dealt with during that time as well uh, that could have, could have been used on appeal. So, you know, it's not just the judge's conduct that we're talking about. We're talking also about, uh, you know, litigants' rights. And if there is an issue that has just been put on the record that there's no longer any record of, it severely jeopardizes the rights of the party. Uh, in closing, I believe uh, this bill does have great merit. Um, I will ensure, it will ensure that the playing field is leveled for all parties and it will discourage the altering of court records. 
Uh, I understand the opposing argument is that this would increase the costs of the judiciary. Ensuring that our family court system is fair and balanced and there's an equal playing field for all, I think that far outweighs any discussion regarding finances and, and money. So I want to thank you for your time. It's been a real privilege and honor to be here today. Thank you, Councillor. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you so much for thank your you. testimony. Thank you. The chair recognizes uh, Dana Albrecht. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Dana Albrecht. You may be familiar with me from prior testimony uh, on other bills uh, or articles in the Union Leader. I am one of the parties who has been uh, adversely affected very strongly by the issues raised here. And so I would like to speak in strong support of sections two and three of this bill. Uh, time permitting at the discretion of the committee, I can in chair, I can cycle back to thoughts on one, your call on that. Um, Please be brief. Yes, uh, two reasons. Uh, Number one, this provides strong accountability to the New Hampshire Judicial Branch. And number two, this helps alleviate costs to the parties. Concerning accountability, in my own case, we have a case spanning over two years of judicial misconduct where we have three radically different versions of what's supposed to be an official transcript for a single hearing. Um, that hearing, uh, the handouts are sort of evidence in support. They're not my testimony. That hearing took place on November 6th, 2020, before Master Dal Pra. Uh, I immediately ordered a transcript. So far, normal, cost $795.50, and I got it fairly quickly. What I didn't know is that uh, within a week, e-scribers wrote an email to the administrative office of the courts concerning inappropriate comments uh, of the judicial officer, uh, notably who gives an F and calling my children a bunch of morons, and wrote in their email to the AOC, quote, of course we're not going to transcribe that. Uh, the following day, Chief Administrative Judge David King was fully aware of this. He's got the email in front of him, and he wrote an email to Marital Master uh, Daupra in charge of the hearing, spelling out, we've got an issue with these two comments. Uh, what he didn't do is do anything to correct the transcript, and what he didn't do is make clear to the JCC that uh, Master Del Pra had done this. Uh, all he asked is that Master Del Pra speak to the JCC about it. Um, by the time you get to February 16th, you know, these are in chronological order, uh, the JCC is actually dismissed that this is any evidence of wrongdoing. Why? Because they don't have an accurate transcript of the proceedings. Why don't they have an accurate transcript of the proceedings? Because Judge King made sure they never got one. By the time we get to uh, November 30th, you know, quite some time, uh, I'm up on appeal with this. You know, appeals, you need a transcript, and the Supreme Court dockets the first version of the transcript, which is the one I got back when I ordered it, um, just like you would expect. Moving forward, by the time they read my brief and you get to December 25th, December 10th, the Supreme Court realizes that there's a problem with this transcript. So you can see the order in a Supreme Court order in my case where judicial misconduct has been left out of a transcript. Again, the administrative judge made sure it wasn't in there. Um, so by then you get the second version of this. 
Uh, I don't have the final order in here, but I could get it to you. The final order on appeal is, I believe, December 6th, 2021. Uh, and that final order is based off a completely inaccurate transcript. Um, after they already decided this, you get to March of next year and the Judicial Conduct Committee orders a third version of this transcript. The first two versions were only 133 pages long. The third version is 144 pages long. They kind of left this, some stuff out. Uh, I did not include all 410 pages of all three versions of these transcripts. I did in this packet include just enough of covers and last pages so you can kind of tell them apart and figure out the differences uh, and read about the Red Sox in there for any Red Sox fans. Uh, that's only in the third version that got left out of the first two. Um, so uh, eScribers pays again. This is covered by the JCC $950. Um, moving forward, by the time we get to October, uh, I ask, that's when I first find out there's a third version. And I ask eScribers for it, and they tell me they're not allowed to give it to me without the permission of the judicial branch. About one minute to wrap it up, please. OK. Uh, and I think the rest of this speaks for itself. Uh, that's sort of the story. I think we kind of become a spectacle to the world, and to angels and to men. And just to address comments on privacy for rebuttal, um, the bill as written uh, says a party to a case can make a recording. Well, a party to the case can get the official recording and release that as well if they feel like it. So there's really no difference there um, between something they made or the official in terms of privacy. Um, if you would like me to speak to number one, I can. Otherwise, I'll take questions. Uh, section one of the bill. Otherwise, I'll take questions because I realize our time is limited. Representative McMahon. Excuse me. Mr. Albrecht, uh, you've read the bill? Yes. Specific to where there were states in uh, line seven that ultimately three transcripts are generated, plaintiff, defendant, and the, and the court. However, the last statement says the court reviews the differences and then decides what's appropriate. Does that not make this effort moot? In how it's worded. You. Uh, why? I forgive me. I don't understand the question. If we've got. Um, well, let me then yeah. I'll clarify. What and I appreciate your testimony today. You're stating uh, well what I understand. You're stating and up previous testimony as well. And I have the same sensitivity of honesty in, in government yeah. and the court system. Is the uh, who is uh, hitting the button, the key, the, ta the tag on what is recorded, and then what becomes the authority having jurisdiction specific to the testimony as written. Now, there could be three in here. There's, again, plaintiff, defendant. Correct. And, and, and as, I, as you just stated. But that last statement says that, that the court, the authority having jurisdiction within the case, will decide what will be accepted. And when I said de uh, determines which recordings and transcripts are complete and adequate for use in the appellate procedure. Doesn't it make the intent moot that, that the intent there could still allow the judge to kick out what he or, he or she does not want to have in the public sector? Uh, correct, but now you have two other recordings to dispute that to cover all of these other cases you've heard about where people don't have the benefit like I do of sort of more proof and evidence that something was left out. Okay, uh, one follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th does that not then pre uh, presume that the uh, plaintiff or defendant within the case will then appeal to the to the 
to a higher court, and the expense and the cost of that could co be a be a restriction on them able to do that. Uh, sure, but if they're going to appeal, they're better off with it than with that without it, and they could also send it to the JCC rather than do an appeal if they feel there's misconduct. One final one? One more. One more, one final one. Would you agree, then, what we both just said, yeah. that this can continue on, is that a wording here is specific that the testimony as found in the court between the, as in, in the court hearing is specifically only document that will be then made available to all as recorded. I think if there's a dispute, you have up to three versions, and in most cases, hopefully, you don't have a dispute, and everybody's happy with the official one. And you haven't been up to this point. And I haven't been. Thank you, Your Honor. Go ahead. I don't think I deserve that title, but. <laughs> They call me speaker earlier. They're very kind here. <laughs> That's right. Representative Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's good. <laughs> We're supposed to be chairman. Um, I think what you, where we left off uh, is where I want to pick up on that last sentence. And the point I may have been missed there was that it's, you've now moved into the appellate court. You get a different judge on it and that may have been missed but i also on that same sentence i'm concerned about the last phrase there where it's and just read the whole sentence it says the appellate court shall review the differences in recordings and associated transcripts okay so we're, we're in a different court now right and determine which recordings and transcripts are complete and adequate for use in the appellate procedure by using the word complete, it makes me think you have to choose between one and the other. And it sounds like what you want to do is be able to let the appellate judge choose which pieces they want. So I'm concerned about for completeness. I think you're correct, and I suspect you there might be possible for some language revisions to better accomplish the goal here, just to make sure if people feel there are discrepancies that they can look at all of the available material. Maybe you can help us with that. I do not see any of the sponsors of this bill in the room. So if one has questions of improvement before this bill is exact, which it won't be today, uh, just a reminder, you may wish to speak to Representative Bernardi or one of the co-sponsors, because they're not here to uh, note them. Thank you so much for your testimony. You're welcome, Mr. Chairman. Uh, may I submit written later on point one? Sure. Thank you. You've heard numbers of people in support of the bill. Uh, now the chair recognizes someone in opposition to the bill. And as we are trying to balance fairness, especially when uh, testimonies uh, we wish to be limited in length, uh, the opposition will get a little bit more uh, because this person is the opposition. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, Richard Head, please. We've met him this morning, representing the judicial branch. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Richard Head. I'm the government affairs coordinator for the judicial branch. Um, and I, uh, I appreciate your comment, Mr. Chairman, and I put five minutes on the card. If, with obviously your discretion, I may ask for a little more time than that. Um, the bill itself, looking at the bill, one, as I had mentioned this, this morning and as the judges mentioned this morning, there is no longer a family court. Family court is used in the, in the language of this bill. There is a family division. In family division, I think it is also important to recognize and recall what exactly is in the family division, because we're not only talking about uh, divorces and parenting. So family division does have divorce, obviously, in parenting. It involves child support. It involves domestic violence petitions. It involves guardianships of minors, uh, termination of parental rights, abuse and neglect actions children in need of services, juvenile delinquency, and some adoptions. 
this bill is not limited in its scope. It, it says family court. Again, my assumption, it would be that that really is intended to refer to um, family division. I think it's also um, important to know, in, in, and um, I'm gonna start with the transcript and recording part of this bill and then talk about the rules part of the bill. Um, it's also important to know and recognize that there is currently a rule um, regarding photographing and recording and broadcasting um, that already exists in our, in our court and in our family division. And rule 1.29 says that, except as otherwise provided by this rule or other provisions of the law, and it's a long rule, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, um, any person, whether or not a member of an established media organization shall be permitted to photograph, record, and broadcast all court proceedings that are open to the public, provided that such person provides advance notice to the court in accordance with the rule um, that he or she intends to do so. There is a mechanism currently in place with the judge's permission to record in a courtroom. And that's important because the judge is going to recognize who are the parties, who's going to be testifying, what are the issues, and um, is it one legally confidential so it cannot be broadcast? And, and the intent of this bill I get is uh, to provide a, a copy of a record. But if as this bill is written, there is no discretion on the part of the judge and everybody has a right to record everything in family division, we are talking about a, a, a tremendous breadth of cases and also a tremendous risk um, because notwithstanding the goal of it being created as an alternate record, it can be also be used uh, in an abusive way. And it can be used because these things can be immediately posted on the internet. They can be modified if somebody wants to post it on the internet. Um, and they are not, things that are in our control. So we don't have any control over these, rec over these recordings. So they are property of the person who recorded it. The other aspect of it is that if somebody is recording and the judge doesn't know, the judge cannot say, hey, by the way, somebody in the audience may be recording this. It may capture conversations going on around that person um, and they're unaware necessarily that there's a recording going on. Um, there are tremendous risks associated with simply allowing a recording and in fact mandating the right to have a recording in this, in this wide range of, of proceedings. Um, the other aspect of it is that this, as, as was pointed out, the bill would say that the appellate judges, which is our Supreme Court, we don't have an intermediate um, appellate court, that for the vast majority, there are some instances where you appeal to the Superior Court, but Primarily what we're talking about is an appeal to the Supreme Court. And as I read this, it would say that the appellate court shall review the differences. So the judges sort of huddle, start listening to days and days of test of, of recordings and try to figure it out. And the reality is the judges don't determine what is the record, the, the, the Supreme Court judges. For example, the, re, the transcript is created by a transcription agency that's certified they have certain guidelines and, and requirements in the, in the process they use to make a transcript of the official proceeding. If something is said off the record and it is captured on the audio, that does not become a part of the official record. It's not a part of the proceeding. And they have, they have you know, various rules and standards that they apply. And eScribers is, is the current creator of the official transcript that is sent to the Supreme Court. It's not done by court personnel. It's not done um, uh, by the Supreme Court justices. And that record or that transcript is then provided to the court as the official transcript. If somebody says the official transcript is, is an error and here's the error and this is what we think happened and this does happen, they file something with the Supreme Court so we think this transcript is missing something. The Supreme Court justices do not then sort of gather up and decide what it is, what, what is in the official transcript. They send it back to eScribers and say, this was, this was raised, tell us what the official record says. And it comes back and, and sometimes it's a spelling correction, sometimes it's a word, it depends on what it is. Um, but the official transcript is created 
by eScribers. Um, and in addition, this, this bill does not have any standards for the transcript that would be created by this third party. Is it created by an official trans, uh, 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 or a certified transcriptionist? Is it something that is a transcript created by a party writing really fast and saying, this is the transcript I created? It doesn't have any sort of standards associated with it, which is the, the sort of need for having a, a, a certified official record. Um, so we do, in terms of, of the recording, you know, there is a process by which a party or anyone can ask for, to make a recording during the course of a, of a public proceeding. It just simply has to be done with the presiding judge's permission because the presiding judge needs to be able to control the courtroom. Another example would be, we have somebody who's, and these are very personal matters. And if, if in the course of testimony, it becomes apparent that just the fact that, that some number of people are recording this, um, this can affect the way in which people are testifying. And that can have, you know, simply that, that fact can have an impact on some incredibly personal testimony. Uh, and, and we do have a concern that this is going to adversely affect the way in which people testify, the way in which information is provided to the judge, and, and ultimately have a very negative impact on the judicial system, the integrity of the system, and uh, the ability of a judge to control the judge's own courtroom. Um, with regard to the judge turning on and turning off the, the, the recording machine, I did, so I've, I've heard this before. Last year there was testimony to that effect, specifically in that case it was Judge Intracasso. I reached out to the clerk in Nashua and I said, there was testimony that Judge Intracasso was turning the recording on and off. Can you just tell me, can she do that from the bench? So the clerk went up to judge, then former Judge Intercasso's bench, and the, w there is no switch behind the bench. And I also, um, last week when I, when I was talking with Judge Garner about him coming this morning, I asked him, can you turn that recording on and off? And the clerk in Nashua and Judge Garner both said, no, they don't have controls at the bench. You have to get up, you have to get off the bench, you have to go down to where the clerk would normally sit and manually turn it on and off. So there's like, physically, you have to get up and, and go down and turn it on and off. There is, and, and, and the um, clerk in Nashua uh, said, there is a mute button behind the bench, okay? So she, very thorough, ran some tests. And what the mute button does is when people are coming up for a bench conference, she can hit mute, the judge can hit mute, and it doesn't go over the uh, speakers in the courtroom. So we can have a private conversation at the bench that's not broadcast in the courtroom, but the recording continues to run. The mute button did not, and she tested it, did not, does not impact the recording itself. So it, it, I was unable, at least in those instances where I specifically asked for a check on it, uh, they could not recreate that in any way, shape, or form. And Judge Garner uh, said there is simply, in his experience, no way of doing it. We do not, in circuit court, which is family division, have court monitors. Um, a clerk will sometimes be responsible or a bailiff, and you heard that. Um, uh, the judge will ask the bailiff if nobody else is in the courtroom, because we don't use court monitors there anymore, um, to turn it on and not turn it off. But again, has to announce, bailiff, can you please turn that off? Um, I'm, there's some other stuff, but I'm in the interest of time. I'm going to turn over to the issue of court rules and just briefly address the issue of court rules. Um, there were a couple things I just want to clarify. Rule 1.2, as was said, talks about waiver of rules. It doesn't just simply say a judge can waive any and all rules. And by the way, there is, in the executive branch side, a rule about rules. Jail Carr has all the rules about what rules are. And jail car has a very specific rule that says, if there is going to be authority to waive any rule, there has to be a rule that says you can waive rules. If you don't have a rule that says you can waive rules, you simply can't do it. 
every administrative rule you, you look at, there'll be a provision, maybe not up top the way we do it, we put it right at the top. Executive branch rules all have a waiver provision. It's a part of rulemaking. We put ours at the very top, but it does not simply say um, the judge can waive any and all rules. It says a rule can be waived for if good cause appears and justice may require it. That's the sort of standard language you will see in a rules waiver provision. With regard to the rules of evidence, it does not say a judge can waive the rules of evidence. Rule 2.2 says that the rules of evidence do not apply. And this is, again, this is family division rule. And if you think about it, it's an important part of family division because the vast, vast majority of people appearing in family division are pro se. They're not represented by counsel. I took a lot of evidence in law school. I practiced law for 30 plus years. I know the rules of evidence. If you have not shown up in court, the rules of evidence will trap you. They will trap the unwary. You, you know, that is a, a way in which a, a party who's not deeply familiar with the rules of evidence can get stuck and trapped. Um, so we do have a rule that says the rules of evidence don't apply, but the court may utilize the New Hampshire rules of evidence to enhance the predictable, orderly, fair, and reliable presentation of evidence. So for example, there is, and people generally get this, the evidence that's being presented has to be relevant. So yes, the judges may shut somebody down and say, you're not talking about the issue that is before us today. You're talking about something that's very important to you, maybe deeply important to you, but today I'm trying to resolve this issue and so I won't allow that evidence. It has to be relevant. So that is a rule of evidence. That's the type of orderly necessary implementation of the rules that a judge is going to apply in order to ensure that they fit within the 30 minutes, because as you heard Judge Garner this morning, there are going to be another 20 people behind you who also need to come up and have their hearings. Um, so there needs to be some level of control. And again, it gets to that issue of a judge being able to control their own courtroom in their own docket. Um, the other aspect of the rules is you have if you don't know what the rules are to do a blanket waiver without any discretion on the judge. So the judge under this, under this bill would have no discretion to waive a rule. It simply says, thou shall not waive any rules. We have, as was said, a number of rules. And if you're not deeply familiar with all of them, and if you haven't looked at all of them, the unintended consequences are, are significant. So for example, we have a rule that says you have to appear within 15 days. If you can't waive that, sometimes there are very legitimate reasons why somebody is going to be late on an appearance. We can't waive that rule 15 days, day 16 in the morning, they come in, they say whatever their, their excuse was, it's a valid excuse, we can't waive the rules. The legislature says we cannot waive rules, your appearance cannot come in. Okay, now what? That person doesn't have an appearance in the court, they can't participate. Um, it is, uh, we have a rule that says when addressing a witness or the court, you should stand. Um, okay, we can't waive that rule. There are people who are not going to be able to stand. I also don't fully understand the statutory, or I'm sorry, the bill in the sense of the rules because a lot of the times the rule says, you know, X is the rule unless otherwise allowed by the judge. Is that a waiver under this bill or is that not a waiver under the bill? Um, it may not be a waiver under the bill because it's part of the rule itself, but a lot of the rules say that. So it becomes very unclear, at least in my mind, as to, as to truly what the intent is of, of the bill. Um, so I think the, the inability of a blanket prohibition on the court to weigh, to, to, to not be able to waive rules, a prohibition on waiving rules has the opportunity and can create tremendous barriers to justice, create tremendous barriers to fairness, um, and has just a host of unintended consequences. I think what you have is um, judges who are trying to apply a very complex statutory scheme in all of these areas um, that, I, that I went through, which, which is within the context of family division. Um, and it is ultimately the judge's, the need for the judge to be able to take into account 
all of the facts and circumstances when applying the rules and applying the, the uh, right of, a, of anyone, not just parties, to record within the courthouse or within a courtroom um, and to create a, a unwaivable situation, an unwaivable process is going to have significant negative consequences on ultimately the, the ability of the courts uh, to perform its job and perform its, its duties. And Mr. Chairman, if I can just have one second to take a look at my notes from the comments, uh, just to make sure I'm not missing too much. I know I'm missing something. Um, probably not key, but so I'll, I'd be happy to, to stop there and answer any questions. Thank you for your presentation. I'm looking at the history of, of this bill as it's loped its way through this committee and also judiciary. Um, and it was a bill that didn't make it, but it sounds to me like portions of it somehow did make it. It has to do with parties recording in court proceedings, um, having notified the courts and other parties they will be recording. I think you mentioned that's on the books, if I'm not mistaken. It's not a statute, it's a court rule. It's a court rule, okay. It, it applies to each each court, a family division has that rule. So in family division, it is court rule 1.29. Thank you. Any questions? So I've got a bucket of them. Uh, Representative De Simone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All the letters, thank you. Thank you for testifying uh, this afternoon uh, and your extensive research. I appreciate that. I have one question about a, a, a situation that was brought up concerning children who testify and the fact that their comments and so forth should be either redacted from written transcript or removed from verbal. Can you speak a little bit about that? Truthfully, I thank you. I, uh, thank you for the question. I would I need to ask some questions to make sure I'm accurate as to uh, as to exactly how that how that applies in the transcript there are, and what the what the precautions have to be and I'm happy to follow up. I don't know the answer. I'd be reluctant to say the answer without confirming. You can follow up, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I jotted down here, the judge has control of the courtroom. Um, I can understand presiding over a room where you really kind of do want to have control of it. Um, but what if the judge is the problem? We've heard some stories. Um, not most of judges, but it seems like more than one. So there, um, when I think the judges so far referenced are no longer judges. Um, That's not a coincidence. And there have been judicial conduct committee proceedings involving those judges. I know that, so um, in, uh, at the request of Mr. Albrecht, I've listened to, for example, many of the recordings that, that relate to uh, his case um, with Master Delpra. Um, the, my interpretation, and I will caveat it with that, is that the comments of, of Master Dalpra, so these, this was also during an era when um, things were being done remotely. So I believe the, my memory is that the recordings that we're talking about were all remote. So the parties were not all in the courtroom at the time, and that these were comments, um, inappropriate comments made by Master Dalpra, um, not, quote unquote, on the record, not to all the parties. They were essentially comments he was making to himself and to whoever was like his, his clerk in his chambers or in the courtroom, but not as part of the proceeding. Um, one of them was, it, and I won't get into the specifics, but I think that's why it did not make the transcript in the first instance, because I believe the transcriptionist interpreted that to mean it was not a part of the record. Um, and what happened in terms of the transcript after that, truthfully, I'm not, I'm not positive, but those are comments that are in the recordings um, and you can find. I was unable to find, and I truly don't know why, um, 
but I was unable to find the can of worms comment that um, that Ms. Gerard had mentioned. Um, and I know that the Judicial Conduct Committee did hear it because they said that in their in their findings. Um, I simply was unable to find it, but it obviously existed because the uh, the Judicial Conduct Committee did um, report that they listened to it. Um, but beyond that, I, I honestly don't know where that re where that came from or the context of it. Could I infer then from this testimony that um, if different citizens heard a series of inappropriate comments in open court, there is an appeal process, there is a complaint place where people can go, and that place is, takes these seriously. I, I, I think there are two things. Uh, one is the Judicial Conduct Committee. Obviously, if, if there's misbehavior by a judge, that is the appropriate. If it's in open court and it raises questions about the uh, impartiality or the ability of the judge to oversee the case. There could be a motion in that case um, asking the judge to recuse him or herself. Um, I, uh, so, you know, there, there are processes. Um, and if somebody believes that the transcript is missing something and they have some evidence of that, it can be brought forward and, and somebody would have to listen to the recording. But it is ultimately based on the re official recording and the official transcript. Uh, and those are the things that um, we have control over and that we ultimately uh, uh, know is, is the official record. One other comment, we are upgrading our recording system. Um, it became evident during the course of the pandemic when we were doing remote testimony that our current, or our, our existing system was unable to record each party who's coming in on one system separately. Mm. So when people were speaking over each other um, in our old system, they would overlap in the recording also. The new system, uh, primary reason we went out and got it was so that we could now record each person as a separate channel and the transcriptionist can then take the, take the testimony of, of each individual who's testifying. Um, now that we're relying much more on, on remote technology, um, that became apparent during the course of the pandemic that that was a need for an upgrade. You may know from the media that I chair a working group on the uh, dealing with medical malpractice claims and their reportage to the public. And this is a, would you believe, I understand how finely nuanced all of this has to be. It's Thank a difficult job. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I agree. Other questions? Yes, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, taking my question. Um, regarding waivers, is there any, um, are there any record and database of uh, the actual waivers that judges do, for lack of a better term. Um, so if there was a problem, um, it could be easily recognizable um, showing a pattern. Um, so thank you for the question. The okay. answer is, short answer is no. Um, so this, the bill you have before you today, there were two parts, it was two bills last session. Mm -hmm. um, the um, transcript part of it came out of committee, uh, unanimous ITL. Um, the recording, uh, I'm sorry, the waiver part of it came out of it as a new bill, which was to create a database. Um, the, the problem, obviously, with any database is it requires input. So during the course of a uh, you know, two-day trial, three-day trial, judges constantly making decisions is constantly uh, uh, possibly, you know, there's a rule that has to be waived. Judge may not even sort of formally recognize, oh, I'm, rule, I'm waiving rule, you know, 8.2, part B, whatever. It's just they know the, the rule, they know what the situation is, and they're allowing something to come in or they're allowing something to happen. We would have to have either continuous monitoring of every judge every, all the time um, or um, we, we just simply don't have a mechanism for inputting all of this type of data that's happening in real time in every courthouse, in every courtroom, 
both verbally and in writing. So unfortunately, and, and I appreciate the, the desire for it and the interest in it, it is, uh, it would be a remarkably complicated undertaking uh, to be able to do and do well and do accurately um, and would require a fair amount of resources. Thank you. Representative Bickford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, how long was, uh, uh, was it Judge Delper or Marital Master Jel Delper or both? Uh, Master, Del Master Delper. He was how Marital long? Master. Okay. You don't have Marital Masters anymore, right? The last Marital Master retired last year. Yeah, that's the end of that. That's the end of that. Um, but my, how long was uh, Marital Master Delper on the bench? Um, is this to the point of the bill? This is getting a little close to uh, disciplinary matters that perhaps may be beyond our scope. I was kind of following up with what you were, the direction you were going in on the oh. malpractice. There is no good answer I can give to that. Continue for the time being, just be careful. Right. Do you know how long I, Master I, Delper was on the bench? I don't know exactly. It was a, he, was, he had a long tenure uh, as a master, but 20 years comes to mind, but I don't know the answer. That's fine. Thank you. Under Rule 1.2, Waiver of Rules, um, it begins, uh, as good cause appears and as justice may require, the family division may waive the application of any rule. On face value, that sounds wonderful. It begs the question, according to whom? Who makes the decision that that judge may waive that rule? These are all decisions that are being made by the presiding judge. So the presiding judge is the determining factor in good cause and justice in this case. He waives the rules he or she chooses to. Uh, that's correct. The, 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 as with any, any case, mm -hmm. you know, the interpretation of the rules, the waiver of the rules, and the, and the same with the statute is done by the presiding judge based upon the facts, evidence, information before that judge, um, and that judge is, is making, making the decisions. We don't have a process of uh, waiver committee, waiver judge. It's it's the judge okay. who's involved at the time, and they could be happening in real time in the courtroom as information is being presented. Without mentioning names or specifics, um, but more than as a hypothetical, have there been instances where a judge has so missed? the idea of good cause or justice in the waiving of rules, and done it repeatedly, we've all had bad days, that uh, con uh, some judicial conduct is taken against him or her. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I've, would, I've not researched that specifically. Would that be something that you sense your profession would do? I, I apologize, can you repeat the question? I just didn't understand it. Do you, <sighs> Would it be would it be likely never to happen that the judicial review? I missed the exact. Term, oh, the judicial conduct committee. Yeah, yep. Would ever have a situation where Judge X has been brought before them because there have been too many complaints that too many rules have been waived and they just do not seem to be for good cause or or as justice may require. In other words, this person, this judge, is misusing the waiver of rules, and there is a mechanism where that may be dealt with by one's peers. Yeah, so, you know, I don't know. It's, it's you know, parties use the rules in various ways. So when a judge waives a rule, it may very well upset the other party. Uh, because that other party may have seen a great advantage by virtue of the person not filing an appearance on day 15. Um, so, you know, the, the, the reaction to a waiver of a rule can be one of two things. One is, I really, really wanted that rule to be applied as it's written because that was to my uh, advantage in litigation. I've litigated for over 30 years. Uh, I liked it when the rules favored me and when those were waived, I recognized that that was disappointing for me. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect is as you suggest, which is there are occasions if a judge is waiving a rule because that judge is biased and wants a particular party to be successful. 
that in in and a a party an attorney anybody believes that to be true the complaint can be filed with the judicial conduct committee my my answer was simply i've never looked through all of the judicial conduct committee uh, uh, complaints to see sort of whether or not these are triggered or, or whether this is a source of, of complaint. My interest is twofold, the bill at hand and the parallel track that I'm running in terms of malpractice. So I'm interested to see Fair enough. how you do it. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And now we have one final pink card. I will accept no more. We're over time. So... The Honorable Betty Gay, representative for Salem for how many years? Six. Six. And now in va vacationing, how was your trip? Which one? The one we didn't take because we that got one. sick. Oh, bummer. Yeah. Oh. I'll go in April. Okay. Um, We've all, all heard lots of things. Oh, I'm supposed to say Your thank name you, and, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. Well, I had kind of introduced this you. This is Betty Gay from Salem. And Six years. House Bill 218, this financial evaluation, uh, actually contains three former bills. So I'm going to pass around, we're passing around the price of a transcript. I had to call e-scribers because they only tell you the price per page. You have no idea how many pages it takes. But in talking, it's not in writing, but in talking, I found out they estimate 50 pages per hour. Okay, the first price is $7 a page. So for one hour, it's $350. So it's not expensive to get the, uh, the recordings. I didn't even write it down. It's 25 or 35 and you pay that, and then if you want a CD, you pay another 25 So that's, that's not bad. It's the transcripts that cut people out who are not filthy rich or make people who have really great credit run up $100,000. There are people here in this room who have spent more like 300000 And a friend of mine who couldn't come, she became a friend because I was working on this, and she contacted me. You very wisely pointed out that this needs another paragraph that points out what you can use the recordings for. It's just for appellate purposes because um, so she suggested that, um, let's see, it's the judge, let's see, no, the, two points here. <laughs> Oh, she wants you to make sure that you understand that judge definitely can turn the recording off and on because it happened to her. You could watch it happen. And when she got her recording, of course it was missing. <clears throat> Parties, let's see, where is it that the children, she said, my daughters want to make sure that uh, a personal recording made in court would not be able to be publicized. Uh, so she said, I would, would like it that parties may only use the recording for court matters and cannot distribute them in any way, paper or electronically. And if they do, some penalty would be assessed. In no manner may the transcript be used other than within the judicial system in its entirety. I say this because I know my children, her two teenage daughters, would not want what happened to them out in public, or be cherry-picked by parties and used out of context on social media. I was really sad she couldn't come, but the duties of being a single mother are challenging. I'm going to read you seven points. You've already heard so much. Hopefully, these will all strike a point in your memory. Okay, the first one was that we really need an amendment that points out what you'd use this recording for. Two, children ordinarily do not get to testify. They have no right to testify unless the judge permits it. That is a solid rule among these. E-scribers prices, which is, uh, you know, on the green sheet, I have the e-scribers prices and then another company. Um, the point is, 
if that's if the uh, accuracy, you know, I'm sure you pay a premium when you have uh, a chain of command. But the important thing is, does the recording match the transcript? <clears throat> we just discovered, she discovered, that the e scriber services, their prices vary from state to state. It won't take long for transcript differences to be recognized. The appellate, the, the appellate court for family court in New Hampshire is the Supreme Court. You don't get to rehear your case. Uh, that's another bill I'd like to see passed. It used to be that you could go to Superior Court and rehear your case. Now the Supreme Court just evaluates whether the court followed the right procedures. You can't plead that, you know, I didn't get a chance. I was denied an evidentiary hearing. I have two friends that I know were denied evidence. They didn't have to give it to them, so they didn't. And one judge even said, I've already made up my mind, I don't need evidence. It is no surprise that the courts object to every effort to reform. There are people, like all of us, we don't like to be have our errors pointed out. And nobody likes change either, unless they're the ones controlling it. So I'm not surprised that Mr. Head comes once more to every single one of my bills to tell why it would be terrible. But the point is, we have such errors going on in court. The only way, I had to laugh when he said, well, you just show evidence that, uh, that this was done. How do you show evidence that a recording is inadequate if you don't have a recording to prove it? We have lots of incidences of people saying, the judge said so and so and so and so, I paid my 30, 25, 35 bucks. It's not in there. And you can't appeal, you can't appeal it if you don't have evidence. I heard Judge Foley's name mentioned earlier, so I'm going to say it again. Representative, we put just about everybody except uh, the attorney head because he was the only one speaking on the other side. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm going to ask you to speed up. Okay. Thank you. Well, a friend of mine who you all know who's very famous, and I didn't ask her for permission to quote her, so I will not quote her name. She asked prospective judges. She asked current judges. Um. Uh, and one judge said about Foley, oh, he says everybody knows if he has the choice to give custody to, uh, of children to a mother who's been very good and a father who just got spent the last 10 years in prison, he's going to give the kids to the, the father who just got out of prison. I'm really upset that if judges know this, know the prejudice, why isn't the JCC responding? We have lots of experience with people appealing to the JCC and having the response, no finding. So please help us. You can fix the bill. You can fine tune the wording. Just realize how serious this is and how this impacts people's lives to have no alternative and not to be rich. Not, you know, it, you just can't pursue under the current rules unless you've got deep pockets. So let's make it more fair. Thank Any you. questions for the Honorable Betty Gay? Seeing none, thank you so much. Um, that closes the hearing on uh, House Bill 218. A couple things before you leave, please. Um, represent, uh, for retired Representative Gay uh, and Representative Stapleton, if uh, since the prime sponsor is not here, uh, it is ultimately his choice. He can, in two weeks, we can exec the bill as it stands, or it is the choice that based on what was heard today, um, he may wish to have an amendment. That's true with all of these bills. Point of order. What? I thought you guys were the only ones who could submit an amendment. We can receive it from someone else and put our name on it. Okay. So it can become our amendment. Okay. It is our amendment, but somebody else can write it for us and we turn it in. 
Um, I want to give a little peekaboo at what we may be doing next week. Um, I hope to have an exec session on House Bill 34, raising the marriage age to 18. House Bill 200, choice of a counselor. Uh, the first one was Representative Levesque. The second one is Representative Nutter Upham. Um, we will also hear House Bill 471 from Representative Yokola, late of this committee on final disposition in a divorce. We will hear House Bill 438, a support person at family court proceedings, which I take point on, and Representative Long will be in the chair for that one. Next week. You coming? Yeah. Oh, good. Me too. Yeah, well, all right. Um, rep, uh, in the afternoon, House Bill 497, Representative Hull, confidentiality with DCYF things. Uh, Representative Hall also with Bill 535, attorney appointed for a child. We may or may not hear House Bill 120. This is on the Sununu Center's closing, funding for a new place, all of that sort of thing. Uh, we are trying to do this in tandem with the Senate. They may be having an amendment to the bill that is already in the Senate and very similar in the House, and we'll find that out. And they will have their Senate meeting and do whatever they're going to do. And then we have to be ready to jump right away here to get it out of here to finance to the House floor and on its happy little way to the governor, we hope, in about six weeks. So you may hear something about House Bill 120 next week or not and there may be amendments, so watch the press. If you hear the Senate's got an amendment that they have adopted, then that puts us out of sync. We have a committee of conference. We don't want to do that, so just watch the media for that. Um, final item. I did what, what I always did when I was teaching graduate school, and that's if I'm going to teach a course for the first time, I ask colleagues, what's the best book on the subject? So I asked around, and The Best Interests of the Child is considered a wonderful book, and come to find out, Representative Long has known this book for some time. And maybe some of you do. I bought three copies of it, so I wouldn't have to pay postage, you know, get three. And I mean, I'm cheap with other people's money, too. And so I have two of them for sale at my cost here. So first one, who has uh, $21.99, uh, if you come up to me with $22, I have two books, and I have two pennies for change. So anything else before we go? Seeing nothing, thank you. We are done for the day. <laughs>